Psalm 110 The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Uptime Community. We're so glad that you could join us live today. And today's date is April 9th in the year of our Lord, 2024. I'm Greg Messina. And if you are new here, we are a community of believers that are actively studying the Holy Bible, and looking forward to that glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Christ, the way, the truth, the life. We want to make this an interactive forum, so we do welcome your questions and your comments today. I don't know if you know who Jesus is, but if you don't, we do encourage you to get to know him today. I do have to give you some bad news first. We're all sinners. We're all fallen short. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and we deserve eternal separation from God and his blessings. But the good news is our debt or sins have been fully paid for by that finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for our sins. He died, was buried, and was the only person who has risen in a fully glorified body on the third day. You can find the gospel of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and that's to go through the door. Who is the door? Jesus Christ. That's in John 10, 9. And we know that uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life, as we know in John 14, 6. So no one goes to the Father except through him. And um, usually we share a little uh, a verse from Bible Gateway, and we're going to do that right now. We uh, have Bible Gateway up right now, and this is uh, actually the verse of the day for Bible Gateway. And uh, Bible Gateway has, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That's coming from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews 1.3. Praise the Lord. God is so good. And uh, we are so happy that you are with us tonight. Um, we don't have Michael here tonight, but we do have a number of panelists on and uh, a little bit more than we're We've, uh, we're used to, but you know what? We have our special guest, uh, missionary evangelist, Robert Breaker, back on with us. He, is, uh, he has just come back from Israel, and he has uh, a lot to discuss about his trip there. And we are so excited to have him. Uh, missionary evangelist, Robert Breaker, thank you for coming back on. Man. Hello. And, uh, Good to see you. Yes. And of course, we have our uh, usual uptime panelists, we thank you, Bob Barber, for coming back on. Obviously, thank you, hey, everybody. Bob. Yes, and we can't do wait, have. Wait, could be a great night. Yep, we have uh, we have Shane, aka Black Swan, on back on with us tonight. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And brother John L. Fortier, the watchdog. Yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. Very happy to be here. When you say John 14, I so it sounds here John 40. I got I got scared a little bit. I thought you were claiming my uh... <laughs> amen. Oh, you know, the the internet... evening now tonight. Yeah, my bit rate might be uh, dropping here, and that that probably dropped off. So I do apologize. Yeah. So uh, we have, of course, brother Bob Hagen. Hey, how are you doing, everybody? Hey. Uh... Greg, I, I was able to send that to you. 
Okay, uh, you want to? You were able to send a pic. Okay, hopefully we'll bring it up. Be able to yeah, bring it up later. Um, I will try to do that. Um, it's good. It's but, good to be back and uh, a belated happy birthday to the watchdog. Yes, a belated happy oh, birthday yeah. to him. Happy birthday, yes. brother! I got cards and I got cake and all the goodies. Oh, very nice, very nice. Yes, we have I've been blessed. Always so happy tonight. Of and course, then, we we save the best for last. None other. Then Kevin Hookman, welcome, brother. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> Kevin. I'm, Kevin. I was just waiting for you to introduce me as and as a special guest again this week. <laughs> special guest, Kevin. <laughs> I was, I was, I was wondering who you were. I, I yeah, seen you so long. Two weeks in a row. It's 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 a new record. Yeah, I know. It's just. Well, we're glad you're back with us. Now. It just so happens that the watchdog had a birthday. He just celebrated yesterday during the solar eclipse. Amazing. But we also have two other birthdays this month from the panelist, uh, of the panelists on here. Uh, we have Brother Bob Barber, which is coming up uh, on the 11th. Is that right, Brother Bob? That's right. The number 11. And, and the, number all, the, num the number that's all over my ministry. <laughs> and, and we have... Uh, brother Kevin Hookman too, right? What? Yeah, he's coming up. Yeah, on the eighteenth. Uh, nineteenth. Why do I keep saying the eighth? I think it was. 18th. I don't know why. It was almost the twentieth. It was only four, fourteen minutes away from the twentieth. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. really. Well, you know what? We could have celebrated next Tuesday, but hey, we never know if we're going to be yeah. here, now, right? Yeah, might as well <laughs> celebrate it now. <laughs> so, I figured, why not do it now? Let's I like get it. it out of the way. So anyway, we're back for another uptime community, and we have are going to have a jam-packed uh, program tonight. Uh, we're blessed to have missionary evangelist Robert Breaker back on with us to discuss his trip in Israel. Um, as much as I would love to go around the, the table and just ask how everyone's week is, I know uh, for the sake of time, I want to get right into Brother Robert and his, uh, yeah, and his trip. So um and we can discuss what you know what was going on throughout the week as we go along with the program right so brother robert breaker uh, thank you for coming back on with us we yes, want to discuss a little bit about your trip uh first off tell us how it was and um thank god you've got back safely because we hear a lot of stuff going on in israel too yes well as you can tell i'm still a little tired so i don't know if it shows my eyes feel like heavy a little uh, I, it's three o'clock, I think, in Jerusalem. So I'm still at three, I guess, Jerusalem time or something. But uh, I got back, I guess, four days ago or five, something like that. But I still haven't gotten back. I get up at like three in the morning. I can't sleep. And it's just like, well, I guess this is the day I'm starting today. So I, I guess you call that jet lag, but I'm still, I'm still on the time over there, I guess. But um, I hope you all have a lot of questions because uh, I feel like I've said it. On Sunday, we did the service there and where we have service. And I talked about what I learned from my trip to Israel. And I pretty much said it all in that. So I hope you all have seen that. If not, go to my channel and see that video of what I learned. And I've got probably a thousand videos. So I'm going to keep putting videos out little by little over the next couple months of the things that I saw there. But I did not feel um, not safe the whole time I was there, even though there's missiles, there's knife attacks, there's other things in different places. I just, I didn't feel like I was going to a war zone and I didn't think it was a war zone until we go to the border and the um, guy says, uh, you guys got to turn around. This is a war, war zone. It was like, oh, okay. So I felt safe, but over there, not very many tours. A lot of people are scared. And so the tour guides are suffering. They really, really want people to come. And um, like I said, I felt safe. So if other people want to go, um, I would I would say go. But I would also say maybe you should go within the month or two. <laughs> and because after that, who knows? Because I talked. Well, OK, let me just tell you this part where our tour guide was a Messianic Jew and he claimed to believe in Jesus. And I, I believe he does. But um, he felt like his ministry was to go to the soldiers because he used to be a soldier. And he had a whole bunch of handkerchiefs that were all of drab, green color, and they had scripture in Hebrew. And we would go to all the border crossings. Every time he saw a, a soldier, he'd just pull the car over and he'd get out and go talk to him and give him that 
handkerchief and they were getting so happy. And uh, one of them said, I really believe in um, May, June is going to be when this war kicks off. And so it was interesting to be down, you know, there on the street with the soldiers talking to them and how they really feel like May, June, they feel like they're going to be attacked. So mm. is, is that what's going to happen? I don't know. But I'm just telling you what I heard the soldiers tell me. And um, they were on edge. They were very, um, what is the word? They were, they were discouraged because uh, every day, um, as you know, they were attacked on 10-7, right? 10-7 is their 9-11. You know, we think of 9-11 as the date when we were attacked by terrorists. It was 10-7 for them. And every day since that, there has been an attack of one form or another from either Hamas or from Hezbollah. And Hezbollah was sending rockets just about every day. Uh, but if it wasn't a rocket, it was a knife attack. We wanted to go to Jericho, and that was canceled because there was a knife attack the day before. So um, it was neat to be there and talking to them. And our tour guide took us places that we probably weren't allowed to go. <laughs> but because he was ex-military, he just went. And, uh, you know, better to ask for forgiveness than permission, I guess, was his way of looking at that. But uh, we got to go to a lot of places, a lot of places and see a lot of things. And we could we picked up the soldiers because we would talk to the soldiers and we would tell them this. We want you to know that we're praying for you, that we're behind you and that we love you. And uh, we know what you're going through. And I just want you to know there's some Christians praying for you. And that would really make them a little bit more encouraged if you will so that was a, a real blessing amen 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 that's awesome brother and you have posted a lot of great content on your channel um we're so grateful for that because listen it's a place that i would love to go um i know most people say it's a buck you know you, you would put it on a bucket list right but you know what listen when i think of bucket list i say folks this land is all ours once once all is said and done. The, yeah. the Lord's going to give it to all of us. We're going to be able to travel here and there, everywhere, at any point, you know. So don't feel like you're missing out if you can't get to Israel right now. <laughs> right. Okay. The, the right. tour guide asked me, the tour guide says, "Do you so do you like it here? I go, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I've made up my mind. In about seven years, I'm going to move here for a thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, probably, that's probably a real good way of looking at it too. It's like the first time that we'll see, like the first time I'll see Israel is probably when we return on the horses. The bird's eye the first view. time I'll see Israel, yeah. you know, so, all the like, both of us. As a matter of fact, it'll, it'll basically be like drone footage. You, you're like you're the drone. You're just coming down. And you're you're going to be able to see it from yeah. the top view down. Yeah, well, yeah so it's, it's amazing. It's going to be amazing. We're going to see the back of Jesus. If you see the front in that uh, chapter, you're in trouble. Uh -huh. um, that's right you're going uh, to be morning dr robert mm -hmm. you mentioned in one of your videos that uh you're talking about the the tour guide how many people do we need to to get a, a package deal together to go to israel like i see seven people right here i know he said if you could get about 20 people so 20 i don't know what all that entails i guess you have to buy your ticket to tel aviv and then you'd have to pay him as the tour guide and then, um, you know, maybe a tip after that because they, they're really suffering. They do need a tip. But he told me if we could get 20 people together, he'd be my tour guide. And he has a guy that does a bus. But the great thing about our trip is, number one, one of my viewers paid for it. So, hey, man, you know, that was a blessing. But it was just him and another guy. So it was just three of us. So the wow. tour guide drove us around in his own personal car. And wow. so it was very, very awesome because it was like a personal tour. And it wasn't, oh, we're riding in a bus like all these people and, and standing in line. And luckily, there wasn't a lot of lines because tourism's almost dead there because so many people are afraid. And um, it was really a blessing. It was kind of neat because I didn't plan this. But the day I got there was Purim and Pur Purim, you know, Purim, Purim, Hag Purim. And so um, the day that he took us to Jerusalem and the day that we walked into Jesus' tomb, that was resurrection day well you know the world calls it easter but we call it resurrection day wow. we didn't plan that we didn't think that when he bought the tickets and everything so it just worked out that we were there the very day that jesus you know would have risen and so there was a lot of little things like that on the trip that were amazing but yeah he told me if you can get about 20 people together and let him know then we can, can you imagine 20 
Watchmen from Watchmen channels with Dr. Robert Breaker. Like we would be just like little children in a candy store looking around. I was like that. I was just going around going, wow. And there were so many things we wanted to see that we couldn't. And so I just feel like I maybe feel like I saw 10% of what there was to see there. So it's like one trip is not enough because you never get to see everything you wanted to see. And someone in the questions asked if I took my family. Nope, it was just me. And we would go to certain places and the border was closed within five kilometers, sometimes 10 kilometers of the northern border. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Gaza, it was uh, Hamas that attacked from Gaza. Well, on the northern border, it's Hezbollah that shoots rockets and everything. And they have snipers up, too. So you really weren't allowed to go within five to 10 kilometers of the northern border. But our guy took us through there and we got to see Lebanon and we got to go right to the border of Lebanon right there on the Mediterranean. And we weren't supposed to. It was really funny. He just pulls right up to the gate and he goes, there's Lebanon. And then he goes, now watch this. Here comes the guy. The guy came out screaming, the guard. And uh, he said, how did you get in here? And he goes, I'm ex-military. This is my special tour. I'm leaving. And the guy goes, okay. And as we're leaving, he could hear the guard yelling, how did you let that blankety blank guy get through the gate? <laughs> it's like, it's the main gate, that's the border. So that was kind of funny. He would just take us wow. all over the place. But um, wow. that's cool. where was I going with that? So like I said, there was places we'd go to see and you couldn't see it. Um, national parks, we go to national parks and it, the gates closed and it's been closed. It, it was, it was weird because both sides of the road, the grass was grown up three feet mm -hmm. because no, and usually that's a tourist place where every day there's 50, 60 buses coming in there. And one of those places was Benias, which is, uh, used to be called Panias. And that's the place where they call the gates of hell, where Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That was close. So we had to, through the gate, try to get pictures of it. And I did a short on that one. And I wish we could have gone inside. The other was, was it Tel Don? I think it was Tel Don or El Don. It was the platform where I want to say it was Jeroboam. I hope I'm not right, wrong on that. But the guy who built the golden calf in the northern part of Israel. Mm -hmm. They, you can go in there and look at that, but it was closed. It was a national park because they were afraid rockets. And I could have seen where that calf would have been. Now, the calf's not there, but the, the actual giant platform that they worshiped that false idol is still there. Hmm. And so there's things I wanted to see and I didn't get to because they were closed. But, you know, the old saying from Dan to Beersheba, well, we went all the way from Lebanon to all the way down to Egypt to, to a lot, to the Red Sea. So I feel like I got to go from one individual to another, and you don't always get that. Cool. So he did an excellent job of just taking us everywhere. And uh, I got a I got a question for you, Robert. Uh, yes. How was the you were you were able to go and uh, speak with some of the soldiers? Quite a few of the soldiers there. What what kind of a uh, what kind of a sense did you get spiritually that um, you know were any of these guys? Uh, hungry for the word i mean you you planted a lot of seed over there i take it and okay and uh you had and you had the protection of uh, you had the protection of the lord on you while you were there obviously i mean during during this kind of conflict that's going on i'm just wondering if you sensed it uh a lot of the Jews are lost i mean i just hate to say it a lot of them are lost but even as as lost people, they have this national sense of there's going to be a Messiah coming. So they're, they're looking for a Messiah, even though they may not even believe the Bible, but they know it. They've been taught it. They, they, and so it was amazing to talk to them. Many of them would be like, you know, people in America who say I'm a Christian because their parents were Christians. And so they read the Bible. They know some of the stories. It was kind of like the same there, but um, it was funny how my um, tour guide would, would talk to them. And he was a Messianic Jew, so he was telling them, Jesus is your Messiah. And it seemed like that was what he wanted them to get. And I, I had a long talk with him. I said, that's great that you're giving them the who message, but you need to give them the what message. Because if all you're doing is making them believe Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to be left behind at the rapture. Mm -hmm. You need to be telling them that as the Messiah, he died in their place for their sins so they get saved and go at the rapture. Mm -hmm. He said, wow, I hadn't thought of that. So pray for him that he remembers because he said, 
I'll, I'll try to remember that because, you know, it's great to give one message, but you're just preparing them for the tribulation. You need to give them the message for today. But he would go to them and even the lost Jews would say, I can't wait for the coming of the Messiah. Mm. And so he would say that to them and, and he'd say, you know, are you ready for the Messiah to come? Yes, yes, we're ready for the. And so he said, but that's not enough for me. I want, I want to explain to them who the Messiah is because they're going to accept the wrong one. Mm -hmm. so he started saying it this way and he said i feel like the lord gave me this and he said he would go up to the soldiers and he say are you ready for the messiah to return yeah return and they, wow. they were like well yeah and then they stopped and like, <laughs> wait a minute that says, means are you ready for the messiah to come right. but the fact that he used that word return made them go wait what's you talking about <laughs> and you know that stuck with them after and they're thinking return the messiah you mean he's been here already there you go. So he's yep. planting yep. seeds, but he's planting seeds for the tribulation, you know? So yeah. it was very interesting to see the who message and the what message. And I just, I found it fascinating, but you know me, I want them to get the message of the atonement, not just who Jesus is, but what he did for them. Isn't that the key though, is, is, is accepting that Jesus Christ was here before <laughs> and right. that he did his work then. And that it's been it was finished on the cross, and that when you accept that the blood atonement sacrifice, you're saved. Yep. <laughs> That's Absolutely. different than expecting the Messiah to come in the future, because exactly. as you said, you you do that, and you've got a pretty good chance that you're going to accept the wrong one. And we yeah. do know that most of the Jews are going to accept the wrong one, and that there's only yeah. a remnant remnant who are who's, who who are going to call out for Jesus to return because they are going to understand that he had already come. So, right. yeah, no, that's a, that, that's that's awesome to see that. Uh, and I, I really do hope that that some that what it does, it triggers in their mind. Like you said, wait a minute. You know, that's that is the moment where 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 the process starts, isn't it? Where right. it's like, I've got I've got to I got to wrap my head around this, that that the Messiah has already come because I've been told all my life that he has not come yet and that we have mm -hmm. to wait for him. But they know Jesus is a historical figure, so they believe that. So they believe yeah. there was a Jew named Jesus that lived years ago. But that word return just makes, it just made sense that he would say it that way because, wait, what if he was the Messiah? See how that yeah. plants that seed? And here comes Moses and Elijah and the tribulation preaching that. And <laughs> I've heard that guy say that before. So that was just, to me, fascinating. And mm -hmm. um, But again... What atonement do they want? The red heifer and the, you know, the, right. sac the sacrifice in the temple, the rebuilt temple. So it's two different atonements. And they're wanting to go back to that one and not the one that's already been made for them. Yeah, the book of yeah. Hebrews says, do not go back to that. <laughs> you don't need it. Uh, um, Jesus Christ yeah. is, is is the is, is the way. He's the, he is the sacrifice. He is the, he's, he's replaced that. He is the high priest. They don't need a high priest. You don't need to elect this. You don't need that. Mm -hmm. You've already got your high priest. You've already got your intercessor. You've already got your way. And yeah, no, I, I, I see that, that they're looking for atonement, but they're not looking for it in the right place. They're looking for it with blood sacrifice through animals. And that is the old covenant. <clears throat> and that doesn't, that doesn't work anymore. It doesn't no. work anymore. But Pastor they don't Breaker, just, just since you, you, fl you flew over it <laughs> uh, in your statements there, what did they say over there about the red effort? Are they, did you hear anything that? Yeah, the tour guide didn't know much about it as far as, you know, when they're going to do what they're going to do. I think he'd heard that they were there. It did, I don't know if you even knew there was five of them. Um, somewhere on the Mount of Olives, they're supposed to do it. I told him all that, and I don't think he, he like he wasn't keeping up too much with it. And the Mount of Olives, I mean, even Jerusalem is overcrowded. I, there's not a lot of space left. It's all houses everywhere. So if they're going to be doing that, I the whole time I'm on the Mount of Olives, I'm like, where where are they going to do this? Because there's houses everywhere. I mean, is it going to be in the backyard of some guy in his house? I, because there's not a lot of space left in that place. I was just, that was a kind of disappointing at how many houses there were. I was expecting to at least see some fields and maybe some cows or farms or something, but it was just city, wall-to-wall -wall city, Jerusalem, and Mount of Olives. So that was interesting, to say the least. But, um, yeah, it was it was fascinating, but 
I'm thinking to myself, if the Lord tarries, I mean, <laughs> you can't see that stuff because what are you going to do? There's a five story parking garage and then you go down to see in the basement the you know, the, the thing you're there to see. That's what it felt like it would be if it kept growing like it is. And the thing that was fascinating, but also so sad to me was that um, over the last however many years, the Catholics would go over there. Well, maybe I could say 1700 years at least because, you know, Helena went over there, Constantine's uh, mother. They would build the Catholic church right on top of a famous site. So you'd have to go to the Catholic church in order to go into the basement to look at the ruins or look at the site. So it's cool. almost like they had the, the monopoly on a lot of these sites. And that was kind of like, wow. So if you want to go do more archaeology, you have to kind of ask the, that church for permission because it's in their basement, you know? So that was a little um, sad. sad. That is sad. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was fascinating as well was there's the Bible site and the evangelical or Protestant people would say this is the true site because the Bible says, and then there was the traditional Catholic site. Mm -hmm. So the Catholics said, no, this happened here. And you go look at it and you go, oh, that doesn't line up with the Bible. And then you go look at the other side and you go, wow, that's exactly what the Bible says. So it just seems like everything the Catholic Church was saying was wrong. And how how people can still follow that church. And whenever people would come on tours, if you were Catholic, they would only show you the traditional site. Mm -hmm. But if you went on a tour and it was a evangelical or whatever you want to call it, they would show them both sites so that the people can make up their mind. But if they were Catholic, they weren't shown the other site. They were only shown what the Catholics said is the site. So, for example, where Jesus died is called Skull Hill to this day. And we know that as Golgotha or Calvary, the place of the skull. And you walk up there and it says Skull Hill and you look and there it is. The two sunken eyes, the nose has fallen off, but it looks like a skull still. And there's no doubt it says he died near that place of a skull. And you walk less than a minute it's a short walk and you go down to where jesus is tomb was and no doubt that's the place because there was a place for a stone to roll and in the ground you saw this little channel where the stone would have rolled hmm. so there's no doubt that that is the biblical site of the death and the burial of jesus but the catholics had another site it was a huge catholic church built upon it and um you go to that site and inside they have this huge tomb built and you go inside that tomb and you come down and there's a little cave inside. Now I didn't get to go inside the cave because that place creeped me out. I didn't even want to go in there. My <laughs> good guide even said, I'm going to show you this place. But he said, are you sure you want to go in there? There's probably a lot of demons in there. That's what he told me. I was like, I just want to see it. And it was filthy. It was dirty. You look up at the top and it was just the bricks were just nasty black. Mm -hmm. And outside of that Catholic church were the old pillars of the old pagan temple that they built that on top of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you build your foundation on something. Why would you want your foundation to be the pagan? You know what I'm saying? And so to me, that was the lie. That's not where Jesus died. That was not where he buried. That's what Jeez. they said. And there was this huge, long stone that was big enough. It looked like a stretcher almost, but it was a stone where someone's body could lay. And they said that's where Jesus' body laid. But that stone's oh. only like six, 700 years old. There's no record that that goes back to the time of Jesus. And people would come in there and bow down and kiss that rock. Oh. And it just it, it made me go, how could you believe this? Oh, well, cringe. because they didn't tell them of the other place. And they're not reading their Bible. If, if I took them to the other place and I read the scripture, they'd be like, well, then why did they say that over there? This makes more sense. So I saw a lot of deception, a lot of deception. Because you, you, know, want to keep, you want to keep people in the dark. That's why well, they, you know. They isn't had it what the Romans Catholics yeah. are doing all the time, right? They keep yeah. you in the dark, right? Even if it was the real rock, why would you kiss it? Exactly. I mean, it's, that, that is no. That's a well, that's a well, religious spirit right there. That's a, yeah. That's like spirit. that's like Second mm -hmm. Commandment stuff, yes. right? I mean, that mm -hmm. is idols. That is, I mean, that's why the Catholic Church doesn't like that commandment whatsoever. So they, they take that out in the Lutheran Church as well. They just remove that and they make the last commandment two of them, nine and ten. So no, that that, that doesn't fly. You cannot yeah. make a graven image. You cannot make mm -hmm. an idol. You cannot make those and worship those things. 
But that is what exactly what that church does, along with many other things about, you know, telling you that you, you really can't ask for forgiveness yourself. You need to come to us. I mean, they make up all those rules all the time. But to put it on a pagan church makes a lot of sense to me because they want to eradicate that, put their thing in there and say, OK, come here and spend your money, basically, is what, what they did a long yeah. time ago. So, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yep. So it just it was always the right place and in the traditional place. And it didn't take a lot of knowledge to, if you knew your Bible, to say, no, the traditional one seems to always be the wrong one, and the right one is the one that follows the Bible. There you so, go. The traditional but, Catholic church, right, versus the individual right way to go, which is the personal relationship. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, well also, this, you probably get a sense of, uh, that's another thing I was going to quickly ask you, and then I'll shut up here. It's a, you know, you, you also probably get a sense when you're in an area like that when you're seeing what you just said you saw and you were there you get a sense of it is a certain a certain amount of peace when you're when you're in the presence in a place like that and you look at the other one you said it was filthy and dark and all that but you you can kind of spiritually sense that which one was right if you know the word yeah if you don't know the word you're going to be tricked you know you're, we can only show you this Right. Well, I, I want to see what the real place is. Hmm. Yep. We went to the Church of the Assumption or something like that. And you go inside and it, my friend went there a couple months before. And he told me when I went in that place, I felt like I was in Dracula's lair. Oh, wow. so, the same place. And, I, and it was just <laughs> so dark. And so and I was like, yeah, yeah, I see Dracula living here because you could live inside there and never see the sun. And if you were a zombie or a, a vampire, that'd be the best place to stay. But oh, welcome always, to my castle. <laughs> always built on top of those old ruins. Yeah. And uh, it was just incredible. I like seeing old ruins, but I don't like what they built on top of it. Hmm. I have a question. It was fascinating. Uh, well, we went into one church, and it was a Catholic church, and it seems like everything's either 20 to 60 feet below in the time of Jesus than where it is now. So I guess hmm. over 2,000 years you get 20 to 60 feet of, of sand or dirt or whatever on top. So we go inside this Catholic church and you walk all the way to the back and you look down about 20, 30 feet. There's all the old ruins. Well, so I'm walking out as fast as I can and I'm looking through the pews and there's all these glass panes. And so you sit down in the pew and you look down and you look down about 10, 15 feet and you see ruins down there. So you can look down and see them. And this was an old synagogue and there was a lot of Hebrew there. In old sin in old Hebrew, and so here you are in a Catholic church, looking down and reading the old, and it said something to the effect of, "This is a a a early church. Come to get your baptism here, or something like that." In Hebrew, and it was like, "Oh wow!" So was that the right church, or was that one of those in Galatians that were warned against? You know, it just seems like the tradition follows tradition, truth follows truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Was that That's church right. with the, the sepulcher of Jesus was outside the city of David? Yes. Um, they they go back and forth, but they say it was in the city of David. But it, I don't know. I, there's a lot of they have like four different maps from four different times. So if you go through different periods, you can try to. Well, no, in this era, it's not this time. It, you know, it, so okay. there's a lot of that stuff going on. But uh, the oh, yeah. city of David was wow, it was overcrowded, too. And Jerusalem was very hilly. There were so many hills. And I saw Mount Zion. I saw Mount Moriah. I saw the 12, uh, not 12. I saw the gates of Jerusalem. And uh, I drew it in my little journal that I was keeping. I don't know if that'll show up. But here's the gates of Jerusalem. And oh, nice. I've been trying to count them, right? So, in, and like I said, the the old ones are, are, are farther down. So, I count one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. So there's nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine gates of Jerusalem now. Um, there's the Dung Gate, and then you go down around. They have one open called the um, the Leather Makers Gate. Then there's Zion's Gate. Then there's Jaffa Gate, the New Gate, the Damascus Gate. And that was cool because the Damascus Gate, the modern one, was was the level of all the rest of it. But as soon as you walk out the Damascus Gate, you look down to the right, about 25 feet down, and there's the old Damascus Gate. 
mm. in the Damascus Gate because there were two columns on either side that were made in Damascus, and that was the road to Damascus. But both wow. of those columns were missing. They weren't there. So they must have been some sort of yeah. expensive, fancy, nice stone. And I guess somebody over the years said, no, we want that, and they tore it down. Wow. But then you wow. go to the job. You knew that uh, Saul walked right through those gates, right? To, yeah. Right through yeah, that gate to get there, yeah. If you didn't know and your tour guide didn't point it out, you would think it's the one you just went through up top if you didn't right. look down. No, that wasn't it. That would have been up there in his time. Right. It was right. that one down there. So wow. cool. And then you uh, went I, to Herod's Gate, and you mm -hmm. went to – um, Lion's Gate and then the Eastern Gate. So there's nine gates, but then there's the Shepherd's Gate that makes 10 gates. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, New Jerusalem has 12 gates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm of the, the opinion, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm yeah. of the opinion that they're going to, archaeologists are going to say, well, we found two more gates in Israel. Wow. Because if there's 12 in heaven, <laughs> wouldn't there be 12 down here? And there's one called the Sheep's yeah. Gate, so that would make another one. But I'm just, I'm just, I wonder about these things if there weren't originally 12 gates to Jerusalem sure. for the 12 I, tribes of Israel. You know? there, uh, I think, um, go ahead. Shane no has a question though, but go ahead. Oh, the Eye of the Camel? Yeah. So there's the no. some of the uh, little archway doors are called Eyes of the Camel. And the tour guide explained that. So that little door, you almost have to bow your head down just a little to go through a little door like that. And he explained that they used to call that the eye of a needle. And so when Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle, well, a camel, when he gets down on his knees, he can't he can't crawl. Mm -hmm. So when that camel is down on his knees, he is not moving backwards or forwards. Yeah. So even if he gets down on his knees and you think maybe he could clear that, he ain't moving. <laughs> You're going to have to drag him through there or something. So I found that fascinating. A lot of camels, they'd cross their legs behind them when they'd sit down. I thought that was interesting. All so right. now, I think Shane, I understand that. Shane has a question for you. Uh, do you still remember it, Shane? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was just curious about uh, geography because when I read the Bible, I have in my head kind of a little bit about what things look like. I've never been to Israel, but sometimes when you you read scripture where they're coming down from somewhere or they're going up from somewhere. I, does that yeah. give you a little bit more of a perspective? Like when oh, you actually man. put your feet it, in the water and you're looking yeah. around, this is where they fished, that kind yep. of stuff. It sure does. So we flew into Tel Aviv, which is a great place to go because you're right there on the Mediterranean and you're looking, uh, I guess it'd be West to the West, no toward the East, excuse me. From the Mediterranean, you go probably 20 miles and it's still flat. And then you start to see some mountains. So there's a lot of flat there around the Mediterranean. But in the Bible it says they went up to Jerusalem, go up to Jerusalem. go, And it's because you're going up in mountains and Jerusalem's up in the mountains. And so I found that fascinating to go up. And then they went down from Jerusalem. Well, as you go down to the Sea of Galilee, you go downhill a long ways. And then you eventually come back up a little bit. But when you go to the Dead Sea, it's just down, 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 because that's the lowest place on earth. And then we went all the way down to the Red Sea. So I got to dip my feet in five bodies of water, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Mediterranean Sea, and then the Jordan River. So that was really cool. Um, wow. But the thing about Jerusalem, I found fascinating because there's so many hills in Jerusalem that a lot of the streets, they call them the ascent. So the street is also called the ascent because that street goes uphill like this. So you're walking uphill on a street. So you're ascending. So mm. it's called the ascent. So the ascent to this and the ascent to that. And so that was fascinating. We don't use terms like that here in America. You know, um, let's say you're like in, I don't know, some city that's got a lot of hills. You don't say, well, that's this. Let's take that ascent up there. You just say, go up there. But there they use the term ascent. And I found that fascinating. And, um, uh, it was really, really cool. I got to see uh, a lot of different countries from a distance. And um, let's see, I saw Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. So oh, oh. And that country is pretty small. Just think. Yeah. yeah. Just think you're seeing the Judean hills where the Jews are going to flee to, right? Mm -hmm. During that point in which the abomination of desolation takes place mm -hmm. at that point, right? They're going to be fleeing mm -hmm. toward that location in, uh, in Jordan. 
And so, yeah, so the Jordan River is pretty much the border because that, and I call him an evil guy. I really think he was evil because of his lifestyle. But that guy in World War II, uh, Winston Churchill, he's one of the ones that helped to make the borders of Israel. And because there was fighting on either side, he just said, show me a map. And he saw the Jordan River and he just kind of drew his pencils. Let's just make that the border. And that's wow. so wrong. Yeah. And I guess UN and other things have formed the border. And the thing that bothered me about the borders of Israel is how often there was a mountain and the border was like right here so that the, the people on the other side could always shoot down on them. That's not how you have a country. That's not how you have a border. You should have... The border on the other side of the mountain so they can't you know be on top of, coming down on you because you, everybody knows in the military you want the high ground if you sure. want to win the war so to yeah. me that was just sad to see and we went to the sea of galilee which was cold and the the, the sure. red sea was a little or the dead sea was hot but we went to the um sea of galilee on the other side of the sea of galilee that used to be the border with syria so that bank of the Sea of Galilee was the border. And they, they used to sit up in the mountains and try to snipe the, the Israeli uh, fishermen. <laughs> and so I can't remember if it was the Yom Kippur War, if it was the Six Days War. Uh, one was 67, the other was 73. They got that, and that border went way farther out. Well, now you can go to the, to the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. It's the same thing. And you don't have to worry about being sniped, you know? Yeah. So it was just, to me, that was fascinating how unfair it is for them to have their own country, but not be yeah. able to have their borders protected from people that can be higher up shooting down missiles or, or sniping them or things like that. Just it north just, of that, it's the, the Golan Heights, right? That, that's the disputed territory of, of Syria and, and Israel, right? Well, the Golan Heights is where the biggest mountains were, and you yeah. could see Mount Hermon, and Israel only owns something like I think 12% of that mountain, the rest of it's owned by Lebanon and Syria or whatever. But that was a beautiful mountain in the distance. But I remember going up there and we began to get into uh, Baish Bashan, you know, the bulls of Bashan, it says in Psalms 22. And I'm looking at my com computer, I'm looking in the Bible, and it talks about the cedars of Lebanon. And we look over there and all of a sudden Lebanon's, you know, a little ways that way, but there's, there's cedar trees everywhere. It's like, wow, cedars grow well close to Lebanon. And we go through Bashan and all of a sudden there's oak trees everywhere. And it talks about the oaks of Bashan in the Bible. So how yeah. you can say the Bible's not true when you go and you see these places and everything, everything lines up with the Bible. It's yeah. just incredible. incredible. And we, we see a bunch of bulls. And it turns out Bashan is a great place to raise bulls and it's a pasture, man. And it was just like, this is amazing. That's so, why you hear all those stories of all those people who like try to debunk the Bible. When they look yeah. into it e deeper and deeper, they become believers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Because yeah. they can't find anything wrong with it. They can't, they can't find fault with it. They, they, they think they have it and then they go and search and then they actually figure out that, oh my gosh, this is all true. And so he drove us through the mountains and showed us Mount Carmel, where, you know, Elijah would have been. And he would have killed those 400 and was it 450, 450 prophets. Yeah, of Baal and, yeah. and then he goes into a cave. Well, we're driving through the mountains of Carmel and there's just caves everywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, all these things like, well, you know, I don't know which one, but I know he went to a cave. Well, there's plenty of caves in this place. So that lines up with the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it was just incredible. All these things. Uh, we went to Sodom. And, um, you know, the Sodom was one of five cities. So it's called the five cities of the plain. There was Sodom, Zeboim, Zoar, Gomorrah, and I forget what the other was. And so we're driving through there and, and it's all flat. It's a plain, like the Bible says. But God destroyed all those cities. And we just are driving through and, and it just all of a sudden, it just looks like white ash everywhere. Yeah. And it's just a flat plain. And it says the mountains of Sedem. <laughs> well, Sodom, you know, it's just, you know, in Hebrew, you just change the, the vowel. And so those were the Sodom mountains. And then we went through there and we went down into the valleys and they look like walls. They really did. They took us to a place called Zohar, Z-O-H-A-R. Mm -hmm. And that is the biblical Zohar. Yes. And it says, and I'm, I'm reading through the Bible and it says that when Lot fled Sodom, he went to Zohar. He didn't stay there for long, but he went there. Yeah, and he was warned, hey, get out of here too. Yeah. So we had a picnic in Zohar, and we walked around, 
and it looks, it was, I don't know how you can deny it. I mean, you could go there and just say, hey, this just looks like a bunch of rocks that maybe water did something to over the years. Mm -hmm. No, it's more than that. It looks like a city that was just ruined. And then the Romans came in and built on top of that city some some ruins and they had a taxing station. Why would they not? Why would they do that unless they were saying, no, that's where it is. So Zohar, not Zohan. (laughs) But there was one place that you walk up in the rocks and there was a cave. And inside that cave, there was this giant. I mean, it was it was so big around it take two of us almost to put our hands together to be around it. And it was about two and a half feet tall. And it looked like the base of a column. And it was white. And it didn't look like the rocks around it. So either that was a column at one time of this city or that was a base that they did some sort of sacrifice because, you know, they go up to the high places or something. Don't tell me that was just some natural thing. That was a city at one time that God destroyed through fire. And people help but see it. Once yeah, you people saw. are asking for the sulfur balls. Did you find an A? Did I you asked, smell it? Did you see it? I asked the tour guide. He didn't know anything about that. And as we drove by, I mean, if they're there, he didn't know where to go to get them. So he wouldn't sure let it that did. much. So, <laughs> But sure when we did get did. out, as we're going, I guess, north through the mountains of Sodom, the farther north you get, the more salt is everywhere. Oh, yeah. And the salt is just mixed in with the rock. We got out and I licked some of the salt. And then I thought to myself, oh, I'm licking a sodomite. I better not do that. Yeah. I kind of felt like, Ugh. I don't but, know if I would touch one of those things. Or that, salt, that. <laughs> that salt was everywhere. And yeah. so I, I posted, I think today, a short about uh, Lot's wife. And they, they have this little statue they call Lot's wife. That wasn't her. Mm. But that's in the part of the mountain where it's just salt everywhere. Mm. So mm-hmm. that was in, incredible. And then there's a cave there. And there's lots of caves, actually. But Yeah, um, when you get hot, you sweat. And your sweat tastes like salt. So if you're gonna if you're gonna throw down some fire on there, there's gonna be a lot of salt going on. Uh, so that makes sense. You know, a lot of people don't even realize that it wasn't just those two cities either. It was the whole plane right there. All all that and yeah. It was nothing but just I, I wouldn't even call it dirt. It was ash. It was just white ash, and nothing. I mean, nothing grew there. And the Bible says the reason that Lot went there is because it was well watered. Right. <laughs> and, and it was green. So it was the greatest place on earth at one time. Yeah. And you'd want to be there. And now there's nothing. There's no reason to be there. You'll 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 die of thirst if you ever went there if you didn't have a car. I have a so, feeling it's gonna be a great place in the future, too. Well, well right nothing there, went, you know, food. nothing grew. I mean, it was it was very fertile and and it was a great place to be sure. and everything, you know, and it was watered and, and when it was destroyed. It was just, you know, nothing. There's not going to be anything that would grow on, on that. Nothing's going to grow. But the on Dead that. Sea was and there. another proof mm-hmm. that the word is true. And there's a lot of, yeah. So but, you're looking down from the mountains of Sodom and you're seeing the Dead Sea down there as well. And we swam in the Dead Sea. It was wild because it's not sand. It's just you pick up a whole bunch of salt in your hand and it's like salt crystals, like rock candy almost, the salt. Wow. But, um, the Bible says that God's going to heal that water. Right. So all that water one day is going to have fish. That's going to be so incredible. Fresh but, water. Um, <laughs> yeah, but right now, oh, it's horrible. And we saw En Gedi when that was really cool. And that has a very, very old, probably um, 100 years uh, before Jesus or something like that, an old synagogue. And it's pretty well preserved. But if I say in Getty, that should ring a bell if you're reading in Kings and places like that, because that was one of the places where um, Saul went into a cave and then David went in at night and cut his skirt and brought it back. And the next day said, look, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And so he said, oh, you're right, David. OK, so there were caves everywhere in in Getty. And so it's just everything the Bible said, you go to the place and it's just like, yeah. I don't see why this couldn't be. I mean, there's a cave right there, cave right there, just like the Bible says. When you saw that area, you don't know which one, but it's one of those. Did you think, uh, you know what? I I can see why David went here to 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 hide, basically to get away with his men. Well, because there's probably uh, hiding places there, right? Yeah. So the down south is the Negev Desert, Mm -hmm. and if you go around the Dead Sea. You don't, there's nothing there to drink. There, there may be some water here and there, but very little. 
But in the middle, it's called the Wilderness of Zen, Z-I-N. And there is nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. So I can see how they could wander for 40 years in the middle of absolutely nothing and just suffer and just, and it's just going up and down mountains. And it just was like, man, I didn't like that place because there was nothing to see. It was just rock after rock after, and it was just horrible. You know, another part of that is how committed Saul must have been to go there. To go there. Because it's just a place terrible. Why would you go there ever? But you really have to be committed to find somebody to like go there, right? And and I'm sitting there in my mind thinking they're all going there walking, you know, but it makes sense they'd be on a camel because if you're walking all day in that heat, (laughs) you pass out. Yeah. So you're either riding a horse or a camel or something and probably got a lot of shade over you and things like that. But uh, it was uh, pretty amazing. Now we went and we stayed close to the Negev desert and they started to turn that into green. Just like the Bible says, you know, the desert becomes a blooming rose and they had date trees planted everywhere and they just had so much. So just to see how they could turn that um, desert into green. And I think it was the Israelis that invented drip irrigation. So they're the ones that have learned how to turn the desert green and it's just amazing yeah it really is and um, thank you for sharing obviously has anyone else on the panel sorry if we're not asking been to israel no No. anyone else no okay very interesting yeah okay i was supposed to but then (laughs) go ahead my my younger son my younger son went over there at one point yeah yeah I thought about it, but it, I mean, I thought about it maybe like five or five or six, seven years ago. And I was like, I don't know. I think I'm just going to wait around and just watch and see it from the sky first. I, I you know, I just, mm-hmm. I just, I don't know. I just felt like we were so, we we're so close that, but, but now that you're talking about it, yeah. oh, I kind of want to go and see that <laughs> stuff right now. <laughs> My yeah. thought was, I don't want to go there. It's just all desert, but it's yeah. not all desert. Now, yeah, granted a lot of it is, but. There was a lot more good to it and a lot of people were just friendly and nice it was like going to new york city but everybody's nice that's what i felt like yeah. hey and, robert how was the food there robert i mean restaurants the food like is the best i mean i all i can say is you know europe and, and israel they don't use processed food they don't have the gmo garbage and stuff like that so you knew you were getting wholesome real good food and it was just fun to go to a restaurant and the guy comes out and he puts down like 16 different dips and he gives you some pita bread. So I'll be back. So you get all these choices and you're just like dipping in everything. And mm-hmm. there was so many amazing things. Um, I, I love Baba Ganoush. I love hummus. I love the tahini sauce, the garlic sauces, but it was all mm-hmm. good food and it was good for you. So you're not eating garbage. And well, it was somebody just, it amazing. That said they were at, and they were in Israel on, on 10, seven. Wow. So the people were nice. The food was amazing. The language, you know, I took Hebrew in college and I took one year. So just enough to be able to sound it out and try to read it, but but not enough to be able to speak it. But I did learn some words, you know, or I tried. So yes, it's kin and no is low. So I was like kin, kin, low, low, you know, and uh, all sorts of, let's see if I can find some of the words that I remember. And it wasn't, 10 days wasn't long enough because I was just starting to pick up some stuff. And uh, we were there on a Sabbath too. And that was interesting. Um, if you want to say thank you, that's toda. Um, please is bebe kesha. Uh, bruhim abaim, you're welcome. Bete avol, bon appetit. Mashlomech is how are you? Mashlomech. And you're like, oh, I'm fine, thank you. You spit on me, you know? But... Um, how are you wet? How do you say good morning? Boker Tov. Boker Tov. Um, I learned up and down pretty easily because I go to the elevator and the lady goes, Mala or Mata? Mala or Mata? And I'm like, oh, Mala's up and Mata's down. So <laughs> Mala's, Mala's bad. <laughs> yeah, that, a lot of the words I thought I was hearing Spanish. Yeah. yeah a lot exactly. of words that are the same as Spanish, but they don't mean the same thing. So it took me, it, but I could understand in the sentence, pick up a word here and there. So I could. I thought, you know, if I lived there a year or two, I'd pick it up. But um, yeah. hello and goodbye is shalom. And it, talking to this really stressed uh, woman, 
uh, border guard lady. And she said shalom when we showed up. And when we're leaving, she said shalom, you know, for goodbye. But it wasn't goodbye. It was shalom. Like, I really hope a rocket doesn't fall on your head. I hope you have peace. And it was just amazing to, to that that it was like, yeah, you're in a dangerous place. I hope you're peaceful. Not goodbye, but yeah, sure. hey, be careful type thing. Shalom, so it was shalom, amazing. Let them buy. Yeah, I wonder if anybody recognized. I wonder if called someone recognized you there, Robert, or anybody recognize you at all? Yeah, I was okay. So the last day, um, the other two guys had gone back, so I got the tour guide one day by myself, and he knew where I liked to go. He took me to the flea market and the garage sales. He took me to a, um, a really cool Army Navy type place in the downtown area where there's all the antique shops, and this one place had old stuff from world war ii i mean they had a world war ii uh, motorcycle with a sidecar and uniforms and all this stuff and i said where's the bayonets he said oh over here so he's showing me all these knives and then this kid comes up and he goes hey i watch you on youtube your knives are cool and axes two channel so i'm like wow what are the odds <laughs> and then, but i had to be very careful because they passed a law that you can't try to proselytize children so my you know a tour guides telling me who i can pass a track out to who i can't you know and the gospel track that i brought was the one that i wrote called have you received the atonement and that was the one i like to give to people but i also had my little thing that says you know robert breaker on youtube so i'm looking at him and, and he's like no you can't give him the gospel track but you can give him your little youtube card because he already watches you on youtube so but he didn't see my other channel so hopefully he does and hopefully he gets safe but what are the odds that a 14 year old kid watches you on YouTube? That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And so I never would have thought we that. We talked about it months ago that uh, they tried to pass or they were going, well, like they started the attempt to pass so that you couldn't postulize to anybody, right? So they had those two yeah. lawmakers over there, but that got thwarted. So uh, you can still do what you're, you know, what you did. Um, you but that would have passed. It would have been much more difficult, not, I would have thought. But not to children. They really right. get upset. Yeah to do that to children so well, that's been illegal for a long time now yeah mm -hmm. you have to be careful but one guy you know i'm talking to and i give him the track on the atonement he's like what's this and i was like how do i get him to take this and i go it's the atonement don't you remember in synagogue when they talked about leviticus 17 11 the atonement oh yeah i remember that no i don't need it i go yeah you do it talks about that but it also talks about the other atonement don't you know about the other one no he didn't i thought for sure he'd take it but he didn't but he uh, did take my youtube video card so interesting but just uh it's interesting you do your best sometimes they're still blind you know sometimes yeah. do but, they realize they are on the holy land of god like i know they know they're jews and everything and according to the scriptures and all that stuff but do they realize that when they're bare feet on the sand there on the whatever they are on the holy land do they I mean, they I'm, feel that I'm sure they do, but I don't know if they really think about it like we do. But I, I think they believe that they have the one true God. But imagine you being 10 million people and you're surrounded by 1 billion people with a different religion that are against you. Mm -hmm. Imagine living like that every day, always wondering is there going to be another 10 6? And that's just mm -hmm. that's not a way to live. And so that's really kind of sad that they have to go like that, live like that. But yeah. that's the situation they're in, and they believe God, you know, cares about them and loves them. And but they don't trust what God did for them. And that's what's so sad. It sounds like they're very different from American Jews. Very, very different than American Jews because American Jews do not revere the Holy Land whatsoever. Actually, they don't believe in Moses or anything like that. Most of them, they, they don't even believe that they existed. They're like, oh, those are good stories for our people, you know, and and. It's sad to, 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 to know that to the even the Jews here don't even believe that that those things ever even happened. But uh, but the ones in, in Israel, they, they actually they do. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the people in America are just rich, the Jewish rich Jews. So they don't care. But you, I'm starting to see their children are the ones that take trips over there. Mm. And then they start to go, wow, I want to go back. So if you're Jewish and you want to move to Israel, there's a law that allows that. And then you be, make your aliyah is what they call it. Your trip is an aliyah. And you can very quickly become a citizen over there. And so they made it very easy for people to come. 
And there's all different kinds of Jews. You got your Hasidic Jews. You got your Sephardic Jews. You've got your Ashkenaz. I have to say it right now. My tour guy got mad because I'm like Ashkenazi or Nazi. He goes, no, no Nazis. No Jews are Nazis. So <laughs> the Ashkenazis. And so yeah. you've got these. And then you've got the ones, though, that are the Hasidic that have the little curls. Mm. And they, to me, they're kind of like the modern day Pharisees because they are so uh, mm. judgmental. So we were driving on the Sabbath day and they yelled at us, how dare you drive in a car on the Sabbath day? And yeah. I saw one of them um, get mad at a at a woman um, in the military because she was Jewish. Well, men and women have to serve in the military. And he was yeah. yelling at her, telling her she was a whore and all this stuff. And, wow. and she was mad. They were pushing each other. And so I could see that they had that that mentality of I'm better than you because I'm keeping the law and you're not. He's, and he's the know. same guy who yelled at David for, for eating the show right on the on, on the Sabbath. So Probably. You know, it's the same kind of thing. It's the same people that, that, that yelled at uh, at the disciples for, for eating the grain. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the same mentality. It hasn't changed in, two, in, in well, 3,000 years. It's yeah. religion. Religious spirits. It is. So you see that, you know, they're lost because they're Old Testament, not new. Then you see they get a little bit closer and they become messianic Jews. And they said there were about 40,000 messianic Jews in Israel and they're growing in leaps and bounds. More and more people are believing that Jesus was their Messiah, but that's just the who message. So how many are actually trusting in what Jesus did and trusting in his blood alone? Very few. Mm -hmm. And I had two ladies that emailed me and told me they lived there and they wanted to visit me. So they came and they visited with me and they got saved out of the messianic Jewish movement because and they explained it like this. You cannot mix the law and grace. Mm. That's what the Messianic Jews were doing. And they never knew if they were saved. They were hoping they were doing all these things. Fingers mm. crossed. Maybe I'll get to heaven. But when they heard my message of preaching the blood, they're saved. And they say, now we don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> and that sounds like us here. You well, know? they do. They fit into the, the, the body of Christ. And, and exactly. you're much right, though. We are... We, we are everywhere. We are everywhere, but we're not all, all together yet. So unity is coming, though, when the perfect comes. Right, Greg? Exactly. That's right. And I'm not saying all Messianic Jews aren't saved. There might be some that do trust in the blood of Jesus. But a lot of Messianic Jews, though, it's all about we believe who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. But that's all they believe. Mm. So they'll fit very well in the tribulation. But mm. will they go at the rapture if they're not trusting what he did? Because if they're trying to still trust their own righteousness under the law and believe in Jesus, that's not what. So they need to get farther. And, and if you do trust Christ alone, how do you how do you stay with that? Because that's still trying to get you under the law. So there's you know what I mean? It's it's like they're getting more and more truth and they're getting farther away. And it's hard to stay like it's hard to stay in a Catholic church if you're saved. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's hard to stay into the into that if you're if you're saved well yeah so, I mean, if you if you start your salvation right start your salvation and you have a journey and you have to continue on it to be saved that is a whole different thing isn't it, right. it is that that, yeah. that is a, that is a, a long-term lifelong work that you're doing in order to be saved when the bible says not of works lest yeah. any man should boast right. and you're, you you're, have salvation. there's a lot of boasting going on Exactly. So if, that, if, that were the, if that were the case, you would you would be in a better position, Kevin, than I would, because you could boast more than me. Yeah. Well, well, I well could, that, could, I've got more time to, to work out my salvation. You know, I mean, you're you're, you're getting you're getting close uh -oh. to the end. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You young whippers for you. <laughs> Get off my lawn. It was uh, it was really cool though. I mean, they were very accepting. Oh, the other Jews were the Ethiopian Jews, and that was fascinating because mm. you're going around, you're seeing all these people. I'm starting to look at people, and I can tell who's an Arab and who's a Jew. And then all of a sudden, who's this guy? <laughs> and he says he's Jewish. You know, it's a but they they accept the Ethiopian Jews too that moved there. They have the Ark, you know. Yeah, they they claim they do, but I know, I know. but <laughs> it was pretty fascinating. Um, what was really cool was walking around the old city of Jerusalem, the walls, because you just walk around and you look over in the bedrock and there's all these holes, mm -hmm. like little caves. And I just ran over there and said, I'm just going to jump in this one, see where it goes. And I jump inside this cave and it goes back in there like 20 feet. Now, it's nothing but a garbage pile. They just threw garbage in there. But I'm trying to figure out what is this? And then it dawned on me, this is probably a grave. 
Wow. And I bet you that was probably one of the saints which slept, but arose and walked around, and now it's empty, and nobody thinks about that. Mm-hmm. And our tour guide took us up the Mount of Olives to this uh, Muslim guy's house, and his family's lived there for three, four, five generations, and he has what's called the Cave of the Prophets, and he charges people to come into the Cave of the Prophets, and you go down there, and they've excavated, and there were something like twenty-three, I don't remember, twenty-five, something like that different Jewish prophet prophets or the people that help the prophets. And it's most famous for that's the birth, uh, the, the burial of Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. That's where they were buried. Oh, and wow. you're looking around and they're open and there's no bones. So I asked my tour guide, I said, Hey, are there any bones? I don't see any. He goes, no, probably the crusaders took the bones or something like that. I said, well, another option. He goes, what's that? I said, remember when Jesus rose from the dead and many of the saints which slept arose? And a lot of the Messianic Jews, they read the New Testament. His eyes got all real big. And I go, that's probably where the bones went. And he goes, I never thought of that. No wonder they're empty. He thought that was amazing. And it is amazing. So could it be that, you know, all those little caves in the bedrock around Jerusalem, that's where somebody else was buried too? I know. I don't know. They were used once. And then they resurrected and never used again, right? And they're just there. And wow. I don't know why people don't think they're cool. They just walk by and don't even notice them. But there's just holes and caves everywhere. Sounds it's amazing. Cool. Hmm. Very wow. amazing. That is interesting. Awesome. Yeah, very go- Very cool. Did you uh, just lead some people to certain areas in Scripture when you were witnessing there? Uh, just go go check out Galatians, right? Uh, right. Yes. It was it was hard to witness because you, you can tell they don't want to hear. Uh, so understand. Yeah. The best you can do is just say, I'm an American and I, and I hope you know that we love you. We're Christians and we're praying for you. And that, that shocked them right there because they watched the news and they said, I thought all of America hates us. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, no, there's probably mm. 70 to 80 percent of America is behind you because they're Christians. and They love you. It's the news media that tells it's everybody. It's the ones on television that hate you. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, try to tell them, well, you know, I believe that Jesus is your Messiah. You may not believe that, but, you know, what he did for you on the cross is what I'd like you to study more about and see what he did for you. But could you even get that far? Oftentimes they shut you down. They don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. And so the best way was to try to pass out tracks. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes they wanted to talk about worldly things. Oh, you're from America. You know this song, you know, some crazy dumb song that they like or something. Have you seen Prince Harry walking around? You know, the other thing, too, is Jesus said, look, you guys wouldn't even believe the prophets if they came here today. They, you guys would kill them right there in the street. And, sure. and that, you know, so you going there is uh, is an uphill battle, let alone for, the, you know, uh, for you, but the prophets, too. But you got to you got to know that when those hundred like one hundred forty four thousand, you think, that OK, that's a lot of people. That, yeah. that should change them all. That should change all their minds. But that is actually not what happens, even with 144,000 in the tribulation. Right. It's going to take a lot for them to believe. And um, they're going to believe the wrong one for three and a half years. But when their eyes are open and they see it and they flee in the mountains, yeah. which will probably be in the mountains of Jordan, they yeah. will definitely. And so it's all these seeds being planted that's going to one day wake them up. You know, so. like- is a big deal, right? So that's what Jesus said. When you see the abomination of desolation in the temple, and the prophet and the antichrist basically standing there and, and, and causing a desolation where it should not be, then you need to flee. So it, it's going to have to take, and even then, only a remnant goes right. <laughs> so it has to get so far to it that they actually have to see it. And then ultimately have to see the armies coming against them in order to cry out for Jesus to right. come back and save them, right? Right. In in all this, uh, of course, right now they're not acknowledging. Uh, they're not. They do not acknowledge Isaiah fifty three. Right. But when do you think during the seven year tribulation that they might pop in their head and uh, uh, they say, okay. Uh, we made a boo boo here. When mm. when will they when will they get it? Right, like mm. you said, probably in the very middle when they see all the armies coming and the abomination of desolation. They're all so happy because their temples rebuilt, and then now all of a sudden, it's almost like you have to come to your wits end and lose everything before yeah. you start to question and and ask and look. Yeah. 
So it's pretty sad. Someone has, someone has to declare himself as God in a temple that you've waited all your life to have built to your God. And then somebody goes in there and declares himself as God sets up an abomination. That's got to be a shock to the system for a lot of those people. For but sure. even then, they're not necessarily believing that Jesus is the Christ. Because that, that really happens at the very end, John. I mean, that's when Jesus said he's going to come back. When they yes. call for my name to, to come back, that's when I'll do it. Yep. Okay. All right. I, I'm just, it, it, it's nice to what I'm thinking right now in my French mind there. I'm, I'm so happy that Pastor Breaker can talk about it. He did walk on the Holy Land. He was there. And close to the Jews, and that's why I'm just thinking. You no, know, when it's live over there, are, are they realizing where they are? Are they realizing who they are and what they're doing? Right? But it's they're, they're, they're blind. They're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So yeah, you're right, Kevin. It's it's hard to like put it right on yeah. each of them individually, right? Mm. It's like yeah. because they have this blindness as a whole as a whole. So, yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that some of them are able to, to slip out of that blindness into the light. Mm. I think, Robert, that you, you saw a few of those people that get yeah. through the cracks, right? Yeah. There's some that get saved. There's some that don't. But yeah. all Israel shall be saved, the Bible says. So eventually, but right now, um, they're just interested that's in better. making money and having a life. And I don't blame yeah, them. Right. 2,000 years they have had a home land. Yeah. I got a quick question. Well, we are privileged. Uh, we, we are privileged to uh, to see that from our point of view there in the uh, yeah. of course in the seven in the before the rapture. We're privileged to see that and to understand that. Well, we're also part of the jealousy as well, right? Yes. We're also part of the jealousy that's going on because mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not supposed to be in that, but we have been grafted in, mm -hmm. and the fact that we're going to be taken. And that they are not, that's yeah. going to spur even more jealousy. So, but that, but jealousy can also be used in a in a way to change somebody yes. to realize that they're jealous about it and that they actually want that. And so then they figure out how to get it. And mm -hmm. it's not through the means that they thought before. It is. It's actually a much simpler plan. <laughs> Believe that's on the Lord Jesus true. Christ, and you will be saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's a point of view. Okay, Robert, Sorry. I got a, I got a, I got a question for you here, man, because I'm going to be going here pretty quick. What did this okay. do to your faith? What did being over there do to? You? What did it do to bless you? What did it? Did it help your I mean, faith? Did it help your? Uh, it. I mean, I, my faith is strong, <laughs> but no, it I, just, no, I'm, I'm, it I understand that. But I'm just saying, what was it? It. It was just more made it come alive, and it was just more fascinating to see things and. It made you rethink some things like in your mind, you read the Bible, you think it's like this, but then to see it firsthand and go, oh, OK, like one of the things that amazed me. OK, I grew up. We take that out, we catch mullet and we eat mullet. Mm. I go to Israel and I'm expecting all new everything. It's the same plants, the same trees that we have here in Pensacola. And I go to Joppa and I look down in the water and there's a bunch of mullet, same fish that I catch here. So it's just like, wow. So I have a lot more in common than Peter, with Peter than I thought I did because Peter went to Joppa. He's eating some of the same fish I do. And mullet are kosher, I found out. And, and remember when he um, saw the Lord and he, he was naked and he jumped in the water and, and he got his fisher's coat. The Sea of Galilee was cold. <laughs> and so Jesus would have risen around April or May or, or something like that. Here I go in, in March, April, around May. And so it was cold. So he had no wonder he's putting on a coat, a coat. I mean, so yeah. no one. So you're reading the Bible and now all of a sudden you start to understand those things because I'm like, what the heck is he putting a coat on? I, he's over there close to somewhere hot like the Mediterranean. What? No. Okay. Sea of Galilee is fresh water and it's cold okay. unless it goes down. Okay. And then if it goes down and it's yeah. a drought, salt water comes in, which is weird. You haven't figured that so out yet. But so being cool. there. You, weird. you, you know, and I'm, I'm not. Excuse me for saying this in a way, but it's uh, being there. You already believe the word, obviously, but when you, when you see it, it makes it more alive. It's like the word right. of God was not. It was not written by the will of man, but it's holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's a. It proves that 
it proves that it's true. Sure. It, it is of no private interpretation. So when you go over there and you see these incredible things and you're walking and you're going, hey, I know that this is really where, where it was at, not over here where the Roman Catholics say. And I, mm -hmm. I would just have been uh, my I mean, I can imagine my heart would have just been going. Whoa. But it is it's fascinating because it's and I say this a lot. The, the world prove you know, the word is true. We know that. But when you go to places like this, and I've never been, but I'm sure just being there and so people say it's different when you're when you're in that country. It's just and of course, there's war going on, and everything, but you're there and being there and i'm thankful that you were safe when you were there but i know that you had no doubt that you were going to be safe or you wouldn't have gone you know you have to a lot of it's uh you know being having a trip paid for which is a blessing and all that but when you were there and you're with obviously with a a really good guide who was willing to take you to these places where it doesn't always happen that way over there so mm -hmm. god was at work in each step of the way for you it sounds to yeah, me like you really showing you the things that he wanted you to see that you could see and that's really <clears throat> that's fantastic that's really that's really it was amazing yeah. it was just amazing to be in the places that they were so the first day he takes us to caesarea and if you know caesarea in the bible it's by mm -hmm. the mediterranean so it's a port city and yeah. that's where cornelius came from mm -hmm. and cornelius sent his band to where peter was in joppa and said, hey, come here. Well, Peter's up in that room at, or top of the house in Joppa. Well, guess what? It takes two days to walk from Joppa to Caesarea. So that's like filling in the gaps in the Bible. Well, he went over here and he did this. Well, now I know it took him two days to do that. And, and so Cornelius was there. So we go to Caesarea. Well, I know Peter went there and preached to Cornelius. So I'm looking at all these ruins and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder where the house of Cornelius was. It's got to be here someplace. But also yep. when they arrested um, Paul, yep. they put him in Caesarea. So here I am standing where Peter and Paul were in this city. Yeah. Wow. And then to Joppa, where Peter was staying in the house of Simon the Tannerite. Well, you go there, and there's a house, and it says on it, the house of the Simon of uh, of Simon the Tannerite. Now, is that made up? Well, they claim that they've lived there since 2,000 years ago, their family or whatever. I'm thinking maybe there's 20 feet below is yeah. where the real house is, if that's mm -hmm. what it's like everywhere else. But maybe that's the place. If anything, it's built like it was because it had a roof on there. And it was kind of a little mini dome on the roof, but you could go up on top of it. And it just so happened that on the other side of that house was the lighthouse. And on top of that house, there was a wild fig tree growing. Mm. So I'm looking at this, I'm going... Peter took the gospel, the light of the gospel, like the lighthouse. And, you know, the figs are like the the, the Jews. And he <laughs> went more, Paul went more to Jews. Another coincidence. It. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. <laughs> you know, speaking, speaking of that kind of thing where you're like, you're in a certain place or a certain time, and it's just, you, you, you know, it's a, a special moment. I think I was the only one of this panel that actually saw the, the total eclipse in person. Um, did you get any of you? Uh, we talked a little bit before, but none of you said, did, were any of you in, in path of totality? Yeah, no, well, it was in the not, path, it's, but it it's was not probably. easy to be in the path of totality, actually. Um, yesterday's eclipse was only um, in the path of totality of 0.4% of the population of the world. Wow. So there wasn't many people in the, in the path, but I, I was really blessed to be in the path of to, the totality. And the clouds, it was completely overcast in the morning. And we, no one thought we were going to be able to see it. But about 10 minutes before the to total eclipse happened, it cleared up, completely cleared up. And I ha it's, it's, it's hard to put into words um, because we've all seen total eclipses with pictures, videos, people reporting on it, um, you know, news broadcasts showing things getting darker and things like that. And you're like, wow, that's really cool. But I'm telling you, it, it, it does not do justice to the actual experience of looking up and seeing that. And mm -hmm. to me, it was, it, it really, to a lot of people, it's like, oh, that looks really cool. Um, but when you are actually there, a lot of people say that they, they, that something happens to them, that something changes inside of them. 
in a way that they really can't explain, but I can explain it. I can't necessarily explain like how all the emotions and what it looked like and everything like that, except that it looked like a black hole in the sky, mm -hmm. which really, I, I really kind of um, equated that to what ancient people saw. You know, they didn't have computers. They had no predictions. They had nothing. They didn't know it. I mean, some of them were good mathematicians and they could figure some things out, but like the general population, 99.9999% would look at that the first time they ever saw that and say, we're doomed. It's over. It is over. Because that's what it looks like. Because when when you're, we're living here on this planet, we, we rely on, on two sons, the son of God, <laughs> number one for our eternal salvation, and the sun in the sky so that we can continue to live here on earth. <laughs> because without that sun, you do not live. You die. And without the son of God, you die eternally. So looking at that and saying you're doomed uh, is is an absolute natural response because you're expecting to see the sun there. But instead, you're seeing a black hole in the sky and you're seeing stars. The temperature dropped 15 degrees. Birds stopped chirping. The exterior mm -hmm. light of the building went on. It, it felt like I was on another planet. because yeah. I've never seen that before in 54 years, right? Yeah. It's I like, know. it's just not normal. It's not natural. I know. However, what it is and the re but I do understand the reason why it j it's different, why it changes you is because the sun is exactly 400 times the distance away from the earth than the moon is. But the sun is also exactly 400 times bigger than the moon. If that was not the case, we would not have total eclipses like this. Right. Right. So in order for that to happen, it has to be, an ultimate coincidence of one to the 10 to the 63rd power, which is actually in mathematics, that means it's impossible or somebody designed that. And I truly believe that, that God designed that for this planet, for us. And that, that is the, that is the only place in the universe where that exists. Now, look, I can't prove that because I haven't been all over the universe, but I can prove that that is God's signature. 400 is, a, is an interesting number, right? But it's also the, the gematria number of the last uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which means mark, sign, or cross. It's basically what you do when you sign a contract. Mm -hmm. you, put your, you put your X on it. You put your cross on it. You put your mark on it. You put your sign on it. God's signature is right there. And looking up at it, there's no doubt that that's God's signature looking down right at us. And that's why people have a, have some kind of something inside of them because they are connected to the creator themselves, whether they, they know it or not, like what that is, but they know it's something. But if you do know the creator and you know his son, it's a more special moment because you know what you're looking at. You're looking at God's mark. It, it, mm -hmm. it, that's about as best as I can put it in words. Amen. You know what the best part about it too, Kevin, is the fact that it never changes. Yeah. But they thousands of years they've seen eclipses, and that distance has never changed. It That's continues right. to stay four hundred times. That's right. The sun it never changes. Doesn't it stays yeah. perfect all the time? Yeah, it was four and a half minutes here of total. That is right. a long time. Like the longest you could possibly have is like seven minutes, but that like hardly ever occurs. But like four and a half minutes is a long time to be looking up at a black hole. And by the way, that is the only time that you can look at the sun right. is if it's a 100% eclipsed. If it's 99.9, right. .9, you cannot look at it. But if it's 100, the only way you can see it, because you can't see it through filters, it's black. <laughs> so a solar filter, because you look at it, you look at it, you see the crescent, you see it go away and then it's black. And you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so it, four wow. and a half minutes of that was just like a, yeah. a special. Spectacular. Community. Spectacular! Yeah. I got the I got the chance to see the uh, 2017 eclipse in totality yeah. in Atkinson, Kansas. I was actually on a project on a film shoot at that point, but it was exactly what you're describing, Kevin. I mean, it really is amazing. Everything that you said is absolutely true, and everything I, I experienced that day, um, it's amazing. It's amazing, and and only God can do that. Yeah. Only God can make this happen. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? 
Yeah. Yeah. You look at it and you know, you know, it's like, this is designed. This is the creator. This is God doing this. What an amazing show. What an amazing thing to, to allow us to be it's able amazing. to see. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to see in the future. I, that's what else I thought too, is like, now, wait a minute. You said, I can't imagine things that, that, we're, that I can't even see. And I'm looking at this beautiful thing and I'm going, oh man, I, I can't wait to see all those other things, you know? You know, uh, we talked about before in the past about the size of the New Jerusalem, okay? 1,500 miles square, all right? And I did a math on that. The, basically, the height of the New Jerusalem, if you put it on the planet Earth right now, all right? Mm -hmm. If it sat on America and it'll cover most of America, but by comparison, the International Space Station will crash into the stair steps at the bottom of the building. <laughs> That's how big it is, okay? <laughs> it's huge. But I remember, um, Kevin, you gave us an estimate, and it might be off here a little bit, but I decided to take the time during praise and worship. The Lord just was just hitting me with this, with the new Jerusalem, how big it is. And yeah. basically, um, the everybody has a space of about seven Empire State buildings inside the new Jerusalem. Okay. That's how big your own personal space is. Okay. Now, I did the math. It's 2.7 million square feet. Square feet. Yeah. 2.7 million square feet. The largest house in the world is a palace. That's 2.1 million square feet. The largest in the world, and it's a palace. And then if you take that 2.7 million square feet, multiply it by seven, it's 18.9 million square feet. You know how big that is if it was a ranch? It'll be the size of 57,600 football fields. That's how big hey, your house would no, be. I got a headache now. <laughs> I, I, I did the calculations a while back too, and it's like the real estate inside the Empire State Building times five. Yeah, it's <laughs> insane. <laughs> it's like the size of a city. As I think of the city block is two uh, two hundred and seventeen thousand eight hundred square feet. That's how big a city block is. So basically, your home. If it was all one level, it would be the size of 87 city blocks. Hmm. You can't even comprehend that. I know. <laughs> I have another question for it's Robert. It's beyond understanding. It is. Yeah. I have another yeah. question for Robert. Okay. Um, two things. You can pick whichever one you want to answer, but uh, one of them is how old Hebrew is. Because you mentioned that a little bit. Um, in one of your videos, um, I'm kind of fascinated in that. I don't, I don't know Hebrew, but I, I would, I wouldn't mind the idea of actually learning Hebrew down the road. And then the other thing that you mentioned is that you, uh, you saw some fish that were very similar to a home. Is that because, like, obviously there's latitude and longitudes and all that kind of stuff? Did, did it feel like this is like home or something in some way, like? When you see well, some yeah. of the, the fish in that, so, where we are close to Pensacola, I think we're what thirty second or thirty third parallel, or whatever. But Israel is over there around the thirty first, so it's really almost the same parallel as you go over. So I was expecting some of the things to be the same, but not like so many plants that we have here, not so many trees that we have here. It just seemed like I was home because I was used to all these things. Not like going to South America and seeing all these brand new plants and other things. And the Sea of Galilee had a lot of tilapia in it. So you know what tilapia is. A lot of people eat tilapia. So I found that fascinating. So it did kind of feel like home because I'm just like, wow, I can identify with all this stuff. So that was cool. Now, when it comes to Hebrew, I think Hebrew is the oldest language. In Hebrew, every word has a root word. It's three letters. Well, that reminds you of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And mm -hmm. the tour guide was giving us all these names of animals. And he said, Adam named the animals. And all the names in Hebrew sounds like if you were just looking at an animal, whatever that animal did, that's what you'd name it. So I don't remember the names, but something about a cat says meow. So it was something like that. Uh, a dog, something to do with heart because the dog loves you with all its heart and things like this. It was just incredible. And Hebrew is a, it's an interesting language. You know, you read from right to left instead of left to right. And the best way to learn Hebrew is to learn the song Yankee Doodle Dandy. 
<laughs> oh. then you can remember the alphabet. Aleph, Bet, and Gimel, Dalit, Hey, and Vav, and Zion, Hey, and Tate, and Yod, and Kaf, Lamid, Bim, Nun, Samikai, and Pe, Sadi, Kop, and Resh, Sin, and Shin, and Ta. So there you go. And then you can then you can memorize it. But um, I was over there, and every time I'd see something, I'd try to sound it out, and then I'd look at the tour guide, and I'd say 50% of the time I got it right, but they don't put vowel points under it. Right, right. So when you read the Hebrew Bible, it has vowel points, so you know exactly how to pronounce it. But they're so used to using it, they just spell the letter without the little points under it. So you, it could be A, E, I, O, or U, and you don't know what it is. So. Choose, choose your vowel. <laughs> but it was funny. We were at a hotel, and it was Sabbath, and I looked down, and I said, Shal Shalom Shabbat. And I, I sounded out what it said in Hebrew. And he goes, yeah, Shalom Shabbat, happy Sabbath. And I was like, wow, I just read that. That was cool. So that was kind of fun. And it was uh, interesting, too. You'd say, Shalom Shabbat. Uh, or let's see. Shalom Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. So you'd say, Shalom Shabbat, welcome Sabbath. But when Sabbath was about over, you'd say, Shabbat Shalom. So okay. Sabbath, goodbye. <laughs> so isn't that weird how you just reverse it? Sabbath. And you say, goodbye, Sabbath. That's fun. Huh. It was pretty interesting. And, and once you learn the language, it's just learning those letters and then trying to pronounce them. And it What's probably will take you a couple years to do it. And if you live there and immersed in it, it'd probably take yeah. you less. But it's not the easiest language to learn. I'll just say that. But if For you sure. learn that, then you can learn Aramaic. Then you could probably learn, um, is what is it they use, the Arab language? Um, and then you probably could pick up Syriac. Old Syriac is very close to it as well. So, very cool. Yeah, question for you, Robert. So did you go to the site of the Dome of the Rock, or is no one allowed on it? So we got as close as we could, and our tour guide took us to the house of this guy who was a Muslim, and he let us go into his room and look out the window and take pictures, and it was very close. But then we had to go downstairs to his shop and him try to sell us something. <laughs> so that was the cost of that. But that's as close as we got. Of and course. we didn't buy golden, anything. The golden pimple. But yeah, our tour guide called it the golden pimple because it's going to pop one day. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I wasn't impressed. It, it, it On TV, it looks bigger than it actually is. When you're there, it looks kind of small. Uh, so really I, I, but we did go to the Wailing Wall and I got to touch it and there were not a lot of people there. So that's what was so fascinating. It's, it was Sabbath and it was close to the time where they had to make a run to the house. So they're not out on Sabbath. And we just got to walk in and out front. The first thing you see is this little fountain and there's four copper. They almost look like beer mugs, but they're cups. And you look on the bottom, it's in Hebrew. And you pick those up, fill them with water and wash your hands. And there's your mikvah. And mikvah is what they call uh, ritual washing and mikvah. So you clean your hands that you pick up and they had it's free. They were just free. The little white yarmulke if you didn't have one. And then you put that on, you went over and you prayed. And then there was a, uh, as you go to the wailing wall, it's all right here. The women are on that side, the men are on this side and to the left, there's a tunnel. And that's where the old city was is way down below that. So we got to look down a little glass, um, little window and look down and there it is about 30 feet is the original wall and the original um thing but we didn't get to ever go down there but you walk in here and there's just all these i don't know what else to call them just these hebrew scholars all they do is sit around all day and read their hebrew books and read their hebrew bible and they pray and they just pray and pray and pray and they pray out of the book i mean to me that's you're repeating something that someone else wrote that's not a prayer you should pray from your heart, not just read it. But as we're leaving, this guy said something. I forget the word, but it meant gathering. And I'm like, I've heard that word before. What's he mean? And he was yelling it. And he goes, he's asking people to come gather with him and pray with him. So I thought that was interesting. But hmm. what are they praying for? I'll, I'm going to tell you what I prayed for. I went to the Wailing Wall. And I put my hand on the wall and I prayed for the rapture. <laughs> so hopefully the Lord heard my prayer. If he didn't hear any of the others. But, we you know, were waiting for it. What, um, I, what do they believe that wall is? Do they actually believe that that wall was the sec, sec, part of the second temple? Or do they, do they know that it's no. like the fortress? They think that that was 
the below the foundation of where they believe their temple was. And if you if you follow that wall down, there's another wall. But if you keep going around that wall, it's still the same wall. And that's where a lot of those blocks were thrown over. Mm -hmm. Remember where he says, so the foundation to them was the top of that little built up area. So that's why that can be there and still not be the foundations foundation so it's like if we build a retaining wall you know we have a house and some property like this we build a retaining wall to make it straight then we build our house you pull down the house but the retaining wall is still there right kind of like what that was is in a retaining wall okay it was it was fascinating it was neat but it the weirdest part was you'd look over and there's that tunnel but above that tunnel there was a couple of windows and i said what's up there and they said those are muslim houses so imagine being the Muslim guy that lives like right there and looks out your window every day and sees all these Jews praying. I just would have been so weird. <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to live there, would you? Yeah, well, yeah, you'd think that that would be like the cheapest property in Jerusalem. And that was what was so cheapest. sad was that the Muslim quarter was the biggest part. And yet this is supposed to belong to the Jews and it was divided. Let's see, I showed you my picture. Let me show you. This Jerusalem is divided into four sections or, or four quarters. Right. And I know I got it here. Somewhere. Another bad decision, right? I mean. <laughs> and it, sometimes it, was, it wasn't them that did it, so it's the best yeah. they could do. But you have the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, and the Armenian quarter. So I don't know if you could see that or not. Mm-hmm. But you see the yeah. different quarters. Yeah. The Muslim quarter is the biggest one. It just, yeah. And there's your dome of the rock right there. So the Jewish quarter is down here, and the Wailing Wall would be right about there. But it looks like the Jewish quarter is the smallest. Uh, it almost seems like it, and it's this doesn't make sense. And theirs is the Dung Gate, you know. So it's like like they uh, they don't have what they should have. You know what I mean? They 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 should be getting more, is the way I look yeah, at it. Yeah, have they ever? I mean, right. maybe in, maybe with David and Solomon. I mean, that was probably the the the, the, the heyday. Um, yeah. But but God did say, look, I didn't. I didn't choose you because you were the, the biggest. Actually, I chose you because you were the smallest. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, it kind of makes sense. They're still, still got the small, but there is going to be a time in the future where Israel is going to expand to its full border. And uh, whether or not that's mm-hmm. like realizing the millennium or, or so, uh, probably, probably at the beginning of the millennium is when it, it, you got your new boundaries now. Because uh, up till that point, you've got Antichrist. Although we did talk about how, God uses the Antichrist in order to preserve Jerusalem and so forth. So it doesn't get nuked. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. How big will Israel be during the millennium? Well, in the Bible, it says it goes all the way to the Euphrates River. So it's going to be way bigger. If you look on a map, it looks like just a tiny little sliver. (laughs) But it should be gigantic. It should be way bigger than Lebanon and Syria and all those places. Jordan. Almost like in Iraq. I mean, even to Iraq, yeah. I mean, it's huge. It's going to be gigantic. But right now, it just seems so small. And the reason is, the three main places to remember is the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and Gaza. And that's yeah. all run by the Muslims. So the West Bank is actually on the east side. And mm-hmm. you have to stop. And there's a gate there. And you go through. And that's run by the Muslim Authority. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of it's dangerous. And as we were going by Jericho, he's like, that's Jericho over there. But I'd have to get you a completely different tour guide, one that would swear to keep you alive, you know, make sure nothing happens to you. And, you know, you may or may not make it out alive if you went in there by yourself. So it's like, oh, great. So why is it like that? Imagine living in a country like that. And it's right. just it's sad. And there's all those different zones over there, too, right? Like, they're, they're like it's a control Military is going to control this part, and then the different part is, is under control differently. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. You got make different sense. passes and stuff to pass through different gates and different zones, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you do. We went to the airport. It was Ramadan the whole time we were over there. So they were stopping Good. you at the airport, and they can search you if you want. And my tour guide just goes, it's almost Passover. And the guy laughed. He goes, come on in. He knew that was a Jew because that's what was on his mind. It's almost Passover. So. That was funny. <laughs> wow. But if you look suspicious, they're going to search you because they don't want that stuff to happen again. Sure. So they use profiling, and that's fine as far as I'm concerned. It keeps me safe. Yeah. But Yeah. But it's it all very exciting to yeah. us, you know, especially those of, of us who can't make it there or haven't been there. Thank you so much for this. Uh, 
for uh, sharing. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to continue doing uh, questions as we uh, as we go along. Uh, so feel free to uh, continue to discuss uh, Israel. I think we were also on the topic of the eclipse. Obviously, it's the post eclipse. Um, I know you had a video out recently. What what do you think about that, uh, Robert? What, okay. what are your thoughts on the eclipse? Just briefly. Well, I mean, uh, what it means and symbolizes. I don't think it's coincidence for sure, and I think it's God showing somebody something and. I think with all we've learned over the last several years, especially seven years, that God shows you every seven years what's going to happen the next seven years. So the last time was seven years ago, and it went over those places called Salem, which means peace. And the last seven years has been relative peace. So now this time it comes across, and it comes across seven towns. Now maybe they weren't all in the exact spot, but... They were close to it. Even where I am in Pensacola, I got to see the eclipse because we, we were waiting and we'd look up and we don't want to look at the sun. So all of a sudden some clouds would go over and you could look up when the cloud came. And as the cloud was going away, there was about two or three seconds where you could see it before you had to look away. And where we saw it was about three quarters of the way eclipsed, even as far down as where we were. But um it crossed those seven, well, some people say nine cities named Nineveh, and it started in Jonah. So it's making you think about Jonah. Well, what does Jonah make you think about? Repent in 40 days. So am I saying that in 40 days something's going to happen? I don't know, but I know probably within the seven years, God for sure is telling you, hey, all that wonderful peace, don't look for that anymore. It's going to be earthquake. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, and it's funny that the earthquake that came not too long ago that hit New York, it was centered in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that can't be coincidence because who's shooting rockets at Israel? Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think God's yeah. telling people, and I think he's always tells them before what happens. And that's what the Bible's for. And so I feel like this is an event that is pretty interesting. So even, with, uh, uh, even if you put rainbows in your window. Even if you put rainbows in your window and you say all is well, like they do here in Canada, I don't think all is well. Yeah, I think it's yeah, a, a lot great of rain coming. <laughs> a lot of mockers right now. I've seen them on you, uh, TikTok and Offers, uh, yes. videos now that say, are, is, are, is everybody going to apologize to us, not make apology videos because nothing mm. happened on the day of the eclipse? Who said and, that something was going to happen on the day of the eclipse? Yeah, exactly. Mm. I was like, first of all, it's a sign. Of things to come. That's mm -hmm. why it's yeah. a sign. Okay. Yeah. Now I was telling these guys, like I see a pattern with these signs. I've been watching these things for 12 mm -hmm. years now, especially what happened in 2014 and 15 with the eclipses and stuff like that. And I see usually see a sign of seven that follows these things. Usually right. seven days prior or seven days after, seven months or seven weeks, seven years. Okay. And I've seen that happen, like um, you have seven, you have seven days, uh, for example, Israel. October 7th, seven days later, the uh, the eclipse came through. Okay. Uh, Noah, seven days in the ark before God closed the door. They waited seven days, and then the flood came. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what happened when they did the walls of Jericho? They marched seven times around, and then judgment came. Okay. And uh -oh. so on and so forth. So uh -huh. it's like now if you look at April 8th, I just did the math on it. It's kind of weird because over America, all right, this whole sign got completed. And if you count seven days from April 8th, seven days, it lands on tax day, April <laughs> 15th. Seven <laughs> weeks from now, from April 8th, it will land on Memorial Day. Okay. And seven months from now, it lands during the elections. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, you can't make this stuff up. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> you know what's going on, Sam? Why don't you apologize for not having patience? You ever heard of the, mm -hmm. the saying? That's but, I think that's mm -hmm. what it is. Is like what they, they want to discourage others, and they want to put those other people <laughs> along with them because they just can't wait or they're impatient or whatever. Or maybe someone did say something, and then if you're going to put your trust in what somebody says about this is going to happen on this date in the future. Um, you know, a specific thing on with a specific date. You th that there's nothing biblical about that. There, there's no dates in the Bible. There's no April 23rd, 
2028. There's none of that. What what we are told is that is that there are 6,000 years pointing to man. We know that. We also know that there's 120 years pointing to man for mortality nowadays. That's why the world oldest man just died at 115 because they can't live past 120. So we know those things, but we also know that Jesus said he's going to come back on the third day. He did come back on the third day, but he also going to come back on the third day, which is 2000 years on the, and the third day being the last day, the seventh day of the 7,000 years, which is the millennium. We know that. We also know that Jesus um, resurrected about almost 2000 years ago. So we are getting very close. We also know that Israel became a nation in 1948, but not necessarily declared and and accepted by everybody then. We also have the fig tree generation. So we know all these things are converging right now. Jesus told us what it would be like in the end. Peter told us what it would like be in in the end. We know that we're in the end, uh, but we're not in the end of the end. Because remember, when Jesus talks about the end, but wait, there's more. I'm paraphrasing, right. obviously, but he does yeah. that a few times. So we know that there's there. So so why get all anxious about that and, and, and then bash your fellow brethren? Because that's what Peter says not to do. He says, do not go around and bash your, oh, was it Paul? Sorry. It, do not go around and bash your fellow brethren, basically. It's like, look, you're saying the Lord's tearing. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go out and beat up my fellow brethren. That is not the way to go. But the Bible says that people will do that. So, Bob, that is what we're witnessing right now, which is yet another oh, yeah. proof of that we are in the end. <laughs> well, I just put a video. I just put out a video about the significance of, okay, this is a sign of Jonah. So everybody's counting 40 days from April 8th. So if you count 40 days from April 8th, that will land you on day 40. Then day 41 will be Pentecost, okay, or what people believe to, to be Pentecost. But that would be the day, if that happened during the time of the Ninevites, God would make the decision at on day 41 whether to judge them or not. Mm. Would, he, the judgment is determined on day 41. But we went back and looked at the 2017 eclipse. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is one of the 40, 40 day plus one count two. And we went back to 2017. It was August 21st. If you count 40 days from August 21st, 40, August 21st, 40 days. When you land on day 41, it lands on the Day of Atonement mm. on September 30th. That's day 41 from uh, August 21st. Wow. So there's this 40-day count plus one Day of Atonement 2017. And now they're calling this a sign of Jonah, which is a, also a 40-day count plus the 41st day, which is day, which is, is a, a type of atonement. Because, you know, they are doing a sacrificial offering. And what do they do for the as a sacrificial offering at Passover? And they'll go see whether or not God will accept that offer, uh, offering. The same thing they did with the Day of Atonement when they mm-hmm. sacrificed those goats. Okay, you guys see the, the parallels here? Right. So sure. people are saying that, oh, nothing happened. I was like, of course not. Because mm-hmm. when I see a sign on the highway that says, Quarter mile, your exit, whatever street you're getting off of, the exit's not right there. No, it's a it's a sign of what's coming ahead. So we have at least forty days. Very good. So well, here's coming. here's something too I'd like to add as well. And we're saying forty days, forty one days. So we're going back and forth one day. When what's all this one day thing? I was watching this old movie. I watched like three movies before I went to Israel that are very good. Exodus, um, Cast the Giant Shadow, and I forget the other one. But these are all about how Israel started. And in that movie, it said that Israel became a nation on May 15th, 1948. Well, I thought it was May 14th. Exactly. <laughs> but guess what? Israel's a day ahead. <laughs> right. Right. So in the movie, they weren't wrong, and we're not wrong. For us, it was May 14th. They became, But for them, it was the 15th. Oh, because how about that? So they're a little ahead. So if this sign is for the Jews and we're seeing it here, well, there's nothing wrong with going a day ahead because they're a day ahead. That's so right. Isn't that fascinating how God knows that and we don't think about that? So people <laughs> say nothing happened. Or something happened, an eclipse happened. Oh. And it's like it could have been that it was the start of the countdown. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying the rapture is in 40 or 41 days, but I definitely feel it's within the next seven years. And how... I don't see how it could be this year. This year would be just perfect. When I was over there in Israel, 
I don't remember if someone sent me an email or what, but it made me think about when they when they rebuilt Jerusalem. And that guy that rebuilt Jerusalem said it was in 1541 that he rebuilt with Jerusalem. Hmm. All right. So guess what I did? I just out of curiosity added 490. Mm -hmm. Somebody get a calculator. And then I said, no, 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 I think I'll just subtract seven. So take 1541 and add 483. And what year do you get? That's this year. That's 2024. So yeah. I, it, it just is a perfect time for the Lord to come back if he would, <laughs> you know. But if he doesn't, within the next seven years, I think there's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be all sorts of bad things happening. We might die before the Lord comes back. Mm -hmm. But whatever happens, this was definitely the Lord showing himself because this can't be a coincidence. There's no way that these things happen and then they just happen to correspond with the Feast of Jerusalem if you do 40 or 41 days. That's not an accident. No. That's God saying, hey, I'm the all-powerful, all-knowing, and I even know how I put all these in the stars to, to be a calendar. So there's no doubt that the people that are mocking, they don't understand. You're mocking the all-powerful God who did this. Yes, we all agree we are in the last days, right? Right. Yes. We all agree, right? Obviously. Right. I'm sharing a verse right now, if, uh, if uh, Mr. Greg wants to bring it, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Of course, we are there. But what is more important is verse 5, willingly or ignorant. It's also 1 Corinthians 14, 38. Who wants to be ignorant? Let them mm. be ignorant. That's mm. it. There's mm. nothing you can do. Mm. Uh, you American people have a good saying. You can't fix stupid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I learned yeah. that. Yes, I did. Yeah. So this is this is how it is. I mean, you, you bring them to the creek, but you cannot force them to drink like the horse. You can yeah. bring the horse, put his head in the water. Unfortunately, if he doesn't want to drink, he won't drink. Stubbornness. Yes, right. And that's what we are right now. We are in a stubborn world. Very yeah. stubborn. Oh, yeah. And so stubborn that during the tribulation, they know that God's pouring out the judgment and they still blaspheme him. I mean, when an all powerful God is pouring down wrath on you, you'd think that you'd get on your knees and say, I, I'm sorry. You're but right. that is not what they do. They're so hard headed because they have been given over to their debased mind. God has let them let them do it. God has allowed them. Listen, God, this is not unlike God to give people what they want. You remember the Israelites were like, we're tired, tired of this manna. Can you give us some meat? And he's like, sure, here you go. And they eat it. And they're like, oh, this is so good. Oh, my God, this is terrible. Well, of course, because you're not used to eating that. It's not going to feel good to you. God knows exactly what you need. But it doesn't necessarily mean that when you want something and it's not good, that God's not going to allow you to have it. That God's not yeah. going to sit there and, and watch over you and go, you're not going to be able to do what this because you're a robot and I'm going to control you. Listen, mm. God's given us free will. God's given us the, the ability to, to, to do those things. But what it also does is when you go down those roads, guess what? You find a path back to God because you have nowhere else to go. It's just like the, the, the prodigal son. He came back because he didn't have, he lost it all. And so where was he going to go? He goes back to his father. And just like that, God is, has his arms open saying, I'm here. Come back to me whenever you're ready. Amen. Well, God, you know, the people are asking what the sign means for this eclipse. It's real simple. If you really break it down, when the, that eclipse passed through, the main things that it was pointing out were two things. One, it pointed out the story of Jonah. It went through all the Ninevehs. It went through Jopa. It went through Gord. It went through Jonah. Okay, it was, God will say, hey, judgment's coming. I'm going through these areas judgment's coming and he's saying hey the rapture is coming i went mm. to rapture harmony the rapture is coming okay mm. that's plain and simple god is showing us that daniel's 70th week judgment's coming and the rapture is coming that what that yes. is basically what that sign was for yes we know god's, I, character. Yeah. god's character is that he's long suffering right I, he's yeah. long suffering much long more long suffering than we are because the fact is is he's pure holiness and he's and he's seeing what's going on down here, and he knows what people are going to do in the future. Yet he still is long suffering towards that. But he is going to come back. Jesus is going to return in the clouds, and he is going to take the dead in Christ first. And we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up in the clouds together with them to be the Lord forever. So when that happens, 
that's going to be the perfect timing because it won't be able to go on any longer because you have to cut it so that the tribulation can start so that Jesus can come back because he said if he didn't come back, no one would be left to be saved. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's the I don't, timing of God. I personally don't believe in trust our calendar, okay? I use it for my doctor's appointment. That's it. All yeah. the rest, I'm looking at the fig tree. I'm looking at the Jews. My good question, if I would have Jews around here that I could talk to, Hey, Jews person, what do you think about the eclipse? Because they're probably the one who can make up something with it, right? But I don't trust my our calendar. It's it's garbage. It's it's all off and everything. Uh, I don't think we're really in 2024. I don't know where we are, but we're not in 2024. Something went off somewhere with Constantine and of 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 course the. Um, uh, what's the name of our calendar? Jew, Jew, Gregorian. 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 Thank you. And that's what it is. Instead, the Jews are still keeping the same calendar. So, How and they're the God's people, right? How dare you forget Greg Gorian? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm French. Bum, bum, <laughs> oh, that question about Gregorian. The question about the Antichrist. I don't know if he knows who he is. Um, I know when the devil's in him, he knows who he is, but maybe the man doesn't know. I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know how to answer yeah. that. Yeah. He, maybe he does. Satan, Satan enters into Satan. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's that like, could be when he realizes it. It's like asking if Judah knew when he was born that he yeah, was. Uh, exactly. I was say that. Yeah, you don't. You don't know yeah. when it came in him and he decided to say, okay. Right. Uh, we don't you know. know the the disciples, be here for it. We all the care. disciples... They they were pointing at each other too, going, "Lord, is it is it me? Is it him? Yeah, is it them? Is true. it these guys yeah. here in the panel? Who is it? What?" Right. <laughs> yeah, and Jesus waited until the Last Supper basically to tell him that someone was, you know, that someone here is going to be. He didn't said that before. He said the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, but he didn't say if someone right here is going to. And so maybe that was revealed to Jesus right then and there. You know that oh, it's in this room. Maybe he knew before, and he was told by the Father, don't say anything yet. I'll do it in time. We don't know. But what we also know is that Jesus was also said during that conversation, what are you worried about your brother who's going to be on what side or whatever? You know, It's like, hey, work out your own salvation first, really, is what, is what it all came down to. Same thing that happened after he resurrected. It's like, hey, is uh, you know, is this guy going to live until you come back? And it's like, he's like, what do you care about that? That is, that, so that's why the whole debate over once saved, always saved, always gets me uptight because it's like, why are you worried about whether or not somebody's once saved or always saved? You got to worry about yourself. You got to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, right? I mean, let somebody else decide their fate. Yeah, sure, you you shared the gospel and whatever, but are you going to be over here opining whether or not some or not forever if this and that? Come on. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ told us not to do. That's what Paul told us not to do. He says, go out and spread the gospel. That's what you're supposed to do. Plant a seed, just like what Robert's doing. Not go over there and start working out somebody else's salvation, whether or not they're still in the, in the book <laughs> or not. You know? yeah. Look at the log yeah. in your eye. Look Yo. at that log in your eye. And I think you just... Here's a question just... says, uh, wondering why we are still here. Why can't we leave? Well, it's hand of restraint. Israel's yeah. prophetic timeline hasn't been unpaused yet, so... Yeah. But we also have another opportunity to tell someone the gospel, so yeah. that's, that's why right. we're here. We're to be the light in the darkness, and we're supposed to Tell others about Jesus so that when we're gone, they'll be like, man, that crazy person was right. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's so, right. That's right. <laughs> Why can't we leave? Because because God set the date in eternity past. Why can't we leave? Are we, are we the ones in control of when we leave? No. As a matter of fact, the word rapture means that we're not in control because rapture is all about somebody taking somebody and snatching somebody out of danger or harm's way and basically that the person who's raptured has absolutely no control over that see mm-hmm. they have no control over it they just get taken so we don't have any control when we leave why can't we leave because god does determine when we're going to leave and we don't we're not god good mm-hmm. answer amen great answer amen. i still think it's going to be a big mess when we leave 
like according to everything like the body fluids and the clothing and the blood and everything all that's gonna stay behind yeah, yeah. and it's gonna be such a chaos on the earth like they won't know what to do with this right and all those who raise first the dead one they're already out of blood they're dry so i don't know they're gonna have already a glorified body or something but it's gonna be nasty the day after oh yeah i, I remember morning after the the rapture it's gonna you're gonna have to deal with a lot of poop exactly <laughs> the guys uh those guys i showed a video for i, I think i did a video today i, I ran a quick clip of them. <clears throat> these guys who are remote viewers and they can remote view i guess they're really good to do stuff for the military and stuff like that and i guess they they gave they were given the coordinates of the rapture okay yeah. and they weren't told it was the rapture and they all remote viewed it and they all came back and they were all freaked out because i was like what was that we never seen anything like that before they said we saw people missing kids missing chaos you have aliens everywhere lights going up into the sky what was that mm -hmm. well that was the rapture the Ooh. religious event believed by the christians when they're you know they're talking about us you know they're not believers you know and then they did this whole video on it it was very fascinating i was like wow so basically they had illegal access basically hijacked a, a timeline that, that they were able to see i think the same it's the same timeline that satan sees yeah. you know it's limited information where he bases all his decisions off of but it, i mean they saw it they went there and looked at it okay you people you don't believe in a rapture you don't believe in that, but what was it that these guys went and looked at because they were given coordinates to the rapture resurrection event and they went and watched it and everything they talked about was everything I've been looking at in dreams and visions for the last 12 years about the rapture. Arnold Schwarzenegger will be there too. Yeah. Because he said it, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But um, oh, okay. but um, I'll be back. That picture that you showed, Greg, earlier, I wanted to tell people where that came from. That was an email that I got from one of my viewers who said her mom took that picture of the eclipse, and all of a sudden that figure showed up. How yeah, odd that showed up on her phone. So is that that's the devil saying, hey, now's my time? Or is that, you mm -hmm. know, just, just saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be there soon? I don't know. But that was, I don't know if you could show that again, but that is a, a strange yeah. picture to get on your iPhone. Okay. Picture of an eclipse. I'm going to try to bring it up right now. Okay. But that was what I got an email from today. And I was just like, wow, that is quite strange. Yeah. There's yeah, somebody like, walking uh, there. Hmm. Death or something. You know, like something you see in, like, uh, hmm. what's his name? Scrooge. Hmm. That one, the one ghost or whatever that uh, a future past or whatever that basically hmm. lifts the arm out and points or whatever. That looks like some kind of a figure like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very That's ominous odd. looking. That's yeah. odd. Imagine you take a picture yeah. with your iPhone and look at it later, and you're like, "Oh, what am I looking at yeah. here?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's mm. funny. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy, man. Well, uh, well, we're gonna be busy at the merge of the Lamb and all this, the judgment seat of Christ. Yep. We won't see that. We're just gonna come back with Jesus, right? Amen. <laughs> We're going to see his back. Yeah, that doesn't look like Jesus at the door to me. It uh, looks like oh, something else coming coming <laughs> through that probably shouldn't be, that, that probably is coming through um, for, for those who are dwelling on the earth. And that's not good because the Bible does say that the, that men's heart will, 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 will fail in fear of what's coming upon the earth. On the world. So, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So my friend, he watched the eclipse and he filmed it and he said it got weird because the animals changed. And his and a bee bit his mom or stung mm -hmm. his mom, so that is strange that the animals don't know what's going on and things can happen. So, I don't know, but I just find it fascinating. And uh, there's something physical to it, but also something spiritual to it. So just watch your back everywhere you go. Situational awareness. Just be be careful when you go to the yep. store or anything. Just always be looking head on a swivel because you don't know what might happen next. You know. The birds were chirping. When it was 99.9 .9 and the birds were not chirping for four and a half. Yeah. They stopped. They, they, they stopped. It's insane. insane. You know that awesome. Awesome. 
<laughs> yep, when that passed over Rapture Harmony, it was a uh, three hundred. It was a three minutes fifty one seconds when it passed over Rapture Harmony, Indiana, yep. and that is a, a representation of the one hundred fifty three fish. You take three fifty one and flip it around, it's one hundred fifty three. The one hundred fifty three mm -hmm. fish that they pulled up out and the net did not break. Not a single mm -hmm. one was lost. And I, when I read that. I was like, that's the body of Christ. You have secured salvation. Nobody is lost from the body of Christ. That net, and it was so, there were so many fish in there, yeah, you think yeah. it could break. You think you could lose your salvation, but you don't. You know, even though it's not 1 minute 53 seconds, 351, right? But it's not 350 or 352. It, it's it's exactly the, 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 the opposite of the 153. So, I mean, it's not a coincidence that these things happen, people. This is this yeah. is all pre-designed by, by God who was there in eternity past Absolutely. And knew all these things beforehand. Yeah. Kevin knows his math. He knows yep. the odds. Oh yeah, that's there's. It's not mathematically possible. It is an actual impossibility for us to even exist on this planet without a designer, without God. Exactly. It is impossible for us to even exist as human beings in this form without a designer. It was. It was a. Uh, it was asked many times, Pastor uh, Breaker. What would be your your thought on the CERN? You know that they're constructing a new one, 60 miles around. They just have a 27, so the porthole is not big enough. They're making a new one, 22 billion US dollars to fit, to make it. And they pretend that they're going to make it within four years. What do you think about that? Well, I think there's a nefarious reason for them making that. Um, from what I've studied, they want to see what happens, even though if that destroys everything. So it just shows you how destructive man is if left to himself. He'll destroy himself. And But I do believe it's somehow going to open a spirit hole, porthole. You know, in the Bible, you've got the four angels that come out. You've got these beings that come out, the tails of a scorpion, hair of a woman, all these other things. It's a point in time that that takes place and it's going to happen. And that's probably one of the things that does it. So if that's the case, then these things, these people, I believe, are in cahoots with demonic um, beings. And, and they're probably talking to them and they're telling them, this is what you got to do. You got to do it like this. You got to do it this way. You know, so it, it appears to me that this is all planned and it's the devil's way of speaking to man to get his entrance into this world yeah but so, help, help, the, help the devil oh, yeah. escape, help the devil escape what the devil's not imprisoned in it right now no, but the, the, the devil are, are, and then those other beings are so yeah, yeah. For some this, that question said the devil the devil well the, the devil is not is not does not need to escape anything as a matter of fact the devil wants to to ascend to to god's uh, right. throne and well, overthrow God. That's what he said that army. he's going to do, actually. He That's wants right. these as his army. You remember these four angels are the ones that he told to fall. Mm -hmm. So at one time, they were probably the closest to him. So he wants his buddies back so they can go oh, back okay. to what they were starting to do 6,000 years ago, you know? Yeah, yeah. So okay. He's going to bust his buddies out of jail, I guess. So is the, the question is basically, like, is, he, is CERN trying to help the, the army of the devil with basically the, the, yeah. the pit to open so that all those things can come out? In right. Yeah. 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 right, but they can't open it up. I mean, this the this, this doorway they're trying to open is a doorway created by God. Right. We already know whatever door that God creates, and he if he shuts it, nobody can open it. And only he can open it. Right. And it's an interdimensional doorway, CERN. Basically, what CERN is, is just an overglorified lock pick. That's mm -hmm. what it is. They're trying to pick this door. But yeah, the Bible but says Revelation chapter 9 is they an angel descends with a key to this door. And it just opens right. the door. But they're yeah. trying to pick it right now, or they're trying to hit the door, create little gaps in it. And what I mean by that is if they could they try to create little gaps in it and try to make things happen. Yeah, demons will manifest around the certain location, but then they cannot hold their position because there's not enough energy for them to hold the position until this door totally opens. Once this door, once he comes down and opens it with that key, I mean, it's full power for all these demons to manifest on the physical plane. No problem. They can hurt you, do anything they want to you. You don't want a beer for that, folks. <laughs> you just don't. Like, 
<laughs> the, old, the old movie when the, when the guys go up to the door and they're trying to pick the lock and they're like, I can't get it, I can't get it. And the man walks up and then, like turns the knob and the door opens. It's like right. you need or, you need to know the secret, basically. Or the and, whole like, sword of the stone kind of uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean the know, angel has the key. It's like look how easy this yeah. is. You just turn this and it's exactly <laughs> for the people in the chat. Well, they were requesting for us to go over time, so we officially did. <laughs> yes, we did. Okay. As a matter of fact, we want to respect other people's time as well. So yep, yes. we are going to close this tonight. We want to thank the panelists for coming on. Of course, mm -hmm. our esteemed guest, uh, you mm -hmm. know, thank you, missionary evangelist Robert Breaker, for coming back on to share your trip, your experience in Israel. Uh, very mm -hmm. exciting to hear. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh, we're, we're thankful. We're thankful for you. Yes. We're thankful for the audience who are coming to participate in the in the chat, um, we're thankful for all of you. And um, we don't mm -hmm. know where we're gonna be tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow anyway. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind, Definitely. everyone. And uh, brothers and sisters, we thank you. Uh, we love you in Christ. And Lord willing, we will be back next week. Amen. Keep watching. So, man. God bless. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Uptime Community, an online community of believers actively seeking the return of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. We uncover topics that pertain to Bible prophecy, world events, and unique end-time perspectives. Be sure to catch the midweek studies that are posted every Wednesday. Please feel free to join us so you can participate in this interactive forum. Can't join us live? No problem. We can be found on Facebook and YouTube, and recordings can be downloaded on iTunes and Spotify. Just do a search for Uptime Community and stay informed with the latest happenings at www.uptime.church. God bless you, and we hope to see you there.